Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 124. I am Steve Cray, and I'm joined tonight by Ryan Ponis, the returning guest, fifth time. Oh, come on. No, it has not been that many. Eh, I think it's about the fifth time. And then, COVID uh, doesn't count, for the record. <laughs> we're back in the garage. You, yeah, we're back <laughs> in the garage. You're back. Uh, and then we also have Tim Kolich uh, coming from Pittsburgh area, correct? Yeah, I'm in Keysport area, a little southeast of Pittsburgh. Nice, nice. And uh, so Ryan Ponis is with Alec Bradley Cigars. Correct. So if you guys have tuned in before, uh, you've seen him. We had him on last with, with Alan Rubin. With Alan Rubin. the last one you had. And, uh, and then Tim is uh, owner of... Dirty Dog Cigar Shop. Dirty Dog Cigar Shop in that uh, Pittsburgh area. What was this? What was the city? McKeesport. 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 I think I said that right. Yeah. Sure. You got Crane. You got McKeesport. We're good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, tonight we are uh, going to be smoking something that is actually very special to uh, to Ryan Ponis and uh, close to his heart. Very close to my heart. Very close. In, in the cockles of my heart. The cockles of the cockles. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, Al Bradley Corinthian Leather. That's right. Uh, this is edition one, and it is a territory exclusive to the Midwest, would you say? Rust Belt. We like Rust Belt. Belt. Yeah. We say Rust Belt. Maine. I didn't know that was still a thing. Uh, it's still it rusty. Is. Yeah, it's still <laughs> rusty. Okay, it's still okay, rusty. Fair. Yeah, fair. <laughs> and then tonight we're going to be uh, drinking. Uh, so a couple weeks ago we had Josh Bailey from Altidus on. Correct. And uh, apparently it upset you. It ruined my idea. Not because of it, Josh Bentley. No, it did not. Okay. He's a wonderful human being. He's a snappy dresser. I have no problems with that. All accurate. <laughs> All accurate. Uh, but we, we drank from the Wiggle Distillery last time. And Correct. this is also from Wiggle. This is the Rye Rebellion Small Cast Series. And we're going to be sipping on that tonight and going over that. I want to thank our sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton. They're the ones that kind of hook all this up as far as having the uh, Alec Bradley Corinthian leather. In uh, stock now, and when there is actually a week long up until next Tuesday at Tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio, you can do a buy four, get one of the uh, five packs. And they look like this here, if you can see that, the uh, five pack, you're going to buy four, get one, and they are $9.95 on our shelf. So basically, you're getting $10 off free cigar. I would definitely recommend checking it out, especially if you hear us talk about it. And then uh, also, uh, Altidus USA, behind Tim, we have the banner there with Romeo Julieta, uh, Monte Cristo, H. Upman, multiple others. We have the uh, H. Upman Hispaniola on deck for part two. And then also the BS Cigar Company. I got a couple of golds on the table here. Uh, I've spoken of silver before. Those are available. Also, Patreon.com. Uh, we want to thank uh, all of our patrons out there for uh, sponsoring us. And you can do that, Patreon.com. Uh, slash Bourbon BS Podcast. I think I forgot anyone. Thanks to Nate, live studio audience. Still call him Content Kyle, even though it goes by Kyle B. Smith. Photography. Photo. Keeps changing his name. Or I keep forgetting one or the other. I think it's he keeps changing his name. But uh, Kyle B. Smith Photo on Instagram does some great shots. Uh, we're having him back in the garage. And you guys, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be Thank back. You. It is great like, to be back. Literally. Great to be here back on the road. Uh, just, just here. here, just here. Not so much on the road. No, no, the road's fine, but no, it's not. The, look, the COVID thing we've talked about it before. It, oh, not it's, a lot of value. That's 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 we're, we're there technologically, we, we technologically, yeah, technologically advanced here at Bourbon and BS. And that's, we, that's true. So you know, not that it was a great time the COVID, but you know, with a lot, some good things came. We've some learned things. a lot. Some good. We've learned a lot. We've learned, and a we have lot. some good things here. I've learned there's a lot of people I don't like out there in the world. The social distancing can be <laughs> great. How did you just now learn that? <laughs> is my question. I feel like you I feel like you figured that out. And I feel like it. So in part two, that great segue. Part two tonight is gonna be chapters of our lives or something like that. It sounds like a uh, uh, soap opera. Sure. Yeah. It's chapters of our lives, something along those lines. Um, so interested to learn more about Tim. Ryan, I already know quite a bit about. But so there's, there's, there's always a role officer. So there's a role right. officer. What's that? There's always like, more. There's always there's more to find out. out. Oh, it's like an onion. It's like an a onion. lot of layers. The more you peel, the more you cry. keep the layers on. <laughs> <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> uh, that's t-shirt. All right. Yeah. Oh my God. Anyways, uh, once again, thanks for being here. And uh, if you guys want to like, share, uh, first of all, enjoy. 
But if you are enjoying the podcast, whether you're on Facebook enjoy or YouTube, enjoy responsibly. Uh, don't drink and drive. But if you are listening in the car, you can't smoke. You can't it's fine. Smoke. If you're in a parked car, you shouldn't drink still. Unless you have your kid in your car, then you're an asshole. But that's okay. You know, I did, I've told that story before. We had uh, smoker windows in the old 79 Lincoln Town car. Okay. You know, the little triangle windows. Yes. But it, it never did failed. You Corinthian leather? We had velour interior. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> which I liked more than the leather I saw later on uh, down the road in Seven Nine Lincoln. It was baby blue uh, Lincoln Town Car, and it was uh, baby blue uh, velour interior. Tiny, match your own. Velour or hey, just nice. in the back seat. <laughs> 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 so it came nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even know where it was. Oh, the smoker's window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, back the window. The crack the window. We're coming in hot tonight, ladies. That, that <laughs> sound, it really is. It sounds like my dad. Yeah, so, yeah. He'd be holding his uh, Benson and Hedges. Oh, fuck yeah. yeah. So he'd roll down his little triangle window because it was power and uh, would proceed to not hold it in the left hand, but hold it right in the middle <laughs> of the car. <laughs> the ashtray. And then, you know, my brother or I would say something and we'd be like, hey, can you uh, put that by the window? And his answer to that would just roll down. The other window. <laughs> so now it's all blowing into our faces. And then if it gets caught in a whirlwind, then if the person in the back seat's got to just in you know, a little tornado back there, if there's Benson and Hedges like smoke. <laughs> so yeah, you can smoke in the car. <laughs> a lot of roundabout points coming tonight. I'll Ryan, <laughs> let's get into the cigar actually, because since we have you here and you're able to uh, share this cigar with us, and this is your first time having hands on blending a cigar. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so explain the whole overall project and then maybe dive down a little bit into what you're doing here, where they can get it. Obviously, Tinderbox at Easton in Columbus, Ohio, but also what other shops, what other states are they able to get this, all that good stuff. So so the the whole idea with the, the project was, and it came sort of very off the cuff. Um, last year, we went down to uh, Honduras for our sales meeting. Um, it was already set up that we were going to do some blending with cigars and, and you know play with some tobacco and things like that. And uh, it, it, it just kind of evolved from there. Some of some of the guys have been doing this a while. Like, we, we just got super into it. Uh, there was some degenerate gambling. We had two reps that were literally uh, giving $5 to rollers to just continually roll cigars. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we just kind of went off with it. And to be honest, Alec was very tired of us calling him while on the road. And saying, hey, we got this great idea for a cigar name. Hey, we got this great idea for, like, you know, uh, a theme of a cigar, like, whatever. So, like, the the two things just kind of, like, intersected where Alec was like, you know what? Just let these guys, like, kind of do their own thing. We'll run with it. And uh, that's kind of what we did. And it got more involved while we were down there. And, you know, when we went home, it just continued to evolve. And, um, you know, we would go back and forth on different blends, things like that, yeah. different tweaks. And uh, here we are. And here we are. And here we are. So, Corinthian leather, what does it mean? So, <laughs> wait, Tim, have you smoked this cigar before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that question. So, <laughs> Corinthian leather, uh, the best way I can say it is anybody that knows me knows I, I can have a very bizarre sense of humor and, and facts. strange interests and random facts and all sorts of things like that. Uh, so, Corinthian leather was actually a marketing concept by a company out of Nebraska. To promote the Chrysler Cordoba, yes, and it was yeah. one of those things where, like, they they're they're going back and forth basically, and you know, I'm I'm paraphrasing the story, but you know, essentially they're like, oh, we'll say we have premium leather, and the whole thing's like, um, the whole thing's basically going on with the the idea that, well, we can't just say premium leather; we should have something to say, so we go with, uh, well, we have rich Corinthian leather. Um, and everybody's sort of like, what is Corinthian leather? And they're like, well, it kind of doesn't exist. Right, like, right. All the leather was coming out of New Jersey, from what I understand. Of it. Okay. So, okay. It, and it, it, they got Ricardo Montabon and, you know, all those guys basically uh, uh, got together. They put this, like, script in. He talks about, like, rich Corinthian leather, you know, in the car. It was actually a very successful marketing ploy. Right. And uh, so, and it was just all bullshit. And uh, that that's kind of why I thought it was just hilarious. <laughs> Like you couldn't even be complete mad. bullshit is why you couldn't even be so mad. That, like if you bought it and you found out that Corinthian leather wasn't a thing, but you bought it because it had Corinthian leather, like that's that's funny to me. Yeah, I, I find that hilarious. 
So it sounds nice. It does sound nice. I mean, Pete, there are a lot of matter of fact, when I had talked to Tim, because you know, Tim runs the cigar shop that I came out of working. So yeah, you can thank you for that place of yeah. Uh, cigars. Yeah, it's my cigar ma mater, which I haven't trademarked yet. If you trademark that before me, I'll be very upset. Trademark Ryan Potter. Trademark. Ryan Potter. Yeah, then it worked very, really hard to try to get him a job in another company. <laughs> just to get him out. <laughs> just to get me just out. Just get the hell out. So, uh, success. You know, Tim's Tim's in his seventies, and Tim had no idea that Corinthian leather wasn't actually real. Like when I told him the story, he's like, "That's hilarious!" Like, and it just really is. So, that was sort of where the idea came from. We we got a little carte blanche on the naming. We got some carte blanche on the art direction. You know, I want to go with something classical. We we had toyed with a couple different color schemes, stuff like that. Yeah. Um. And here it is. This is it. Corinthian leather. Corinthian use- leather. All right. So with the, the packaging, obviously, you have a, a car. Yeah. It's like a wrap around here. Mm-hmm. Why the car? Obviously, because of the Corinthian leather. Because of the Corinthian leather. It, this it, is not a Chrysler. It though. is not a this Cordova. This is not no. said car. Cordova, it was a very popular car. It was very successful. Uh, because of the Corinthian the leather. prettiest looking car. So I, I said, let's just go with something yeah. more classical, something that, that makes you think rich Corinthian leather. And that's what we want. Rich. Rich. This is a rich cigar, too. Jenny says uh, Ricardo Montalban was the uh, spokesperson for it. Correct. Yeah. And saved Chrysler before the minivans. I can see that. Which I don't think many minivans had rich Corinthian leather. No. I think they actually had velour. You know, I, okay. So velour <laughs> is a great fabric. <laughs> If, it cleans up easily. What is with you and cleaning up? I feel like Tim, you had a, you had an experience here with a velour interior car, maybe hey. a tracksuit or something. <laughs> he experienced kind of again segue into night's topic. He had a very different experience with velour uh, than in, I vehicles than we did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I don't want to never mind. All right, anyway. Anyway, so tell us about this. What you're able to tell us about the actual cigar itself? I know. So on the box it says you've got like almost like. Um, like, like a movie, movie poster. Yeah. yeah. And it says wrapper type. It's a secret. Binder type, also secret. Filler type, that's a secret too. We just let you keep coming back for more. So yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you in under the Komodo a little bit. The, mm. uh, no, thank no, you. No, thank yeah. you. Well, what if it's made out of velour? Anyway, <laughs> maybe I'll let you under the Komodo a little that's bit. That's why it's so, stained. Uh you have a Honduran uh Trojes wrapper. Uh then on the binder, you have a double binder. Explain Hond- the, the Trojes again because uh, we've talked about that. Alec Bradley. Read it. It'll read it. Okay. So then you have on the binder, uh, Honduran and Nicaraguan tobacco. Mm-hmm. And then in the filler, you have Honduran and Nicaraguan. Okay. I want to go for something medium bodied. I, I smoke a lot of cigars. I, 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 I definitely drink the Kool-Aid with the Alec Bradley model of going for things that are medium body, but full flavor. Right. And that was essentially what right. I was going for. So I'm not going to say this is medium on the nose. I, you know, it's definitely going to be in that medium realm, leaning more towards full body, but um, I didn't want anything that was going to be for a very certain consumer. I wanted something that was a little bit more opened up, but, you know, as far as strength, it wasn't going to necessarily limit no. who's going to smoke it. I would say, I see, I thought it was like more of like a, a medium plus, medium, not medium, I don't know, medium plus. Uh, we had a customer actually uh, who was a listener. He was smoking one this morning. It was, his, I think, first cigar of the day. He thought it was fuller body. And he smokes some fuller stuff. So maybe it is something. I think it's got that little bit of. Um, Could be the first cigar. A little of the day punch in the too. retro hail also. Yeah. I think it's good. I mean, what kind of flavors do you get from it as the creator of this? Uh, so the main thing I was going for was I, I do like Honduran tobacco. That's that's why I wanted to basically specifically work with Rice's Cubanas on this project. Yeah. Um, which is where it's coming out of. It, it's only available in one size is 652. Might as well get that out of the way at Toro size. Um, so the cigar I wanted basically to have a little bit of sweetness to it, like that Honduran tobacco is kind yeah. of known for. Yeah. Which a lot of guys have have um come to me and said, like, oh yeah, like there's a sweetness here. It's very much like a chocolate or almost like a cocoa, even. Um that cedar, um, a little bit of earthiness, obviously a leather quality, um, is something Naturally. that was we were kind of going for on this. Um, but like I said, it, it was something that uh, I want to make sure the flavor profile was right. I want to make sure it was something that I would smoke, not saying that that's what everybody should smoke, but going with that whole idea of um, doing something more that's that's medium in strength, but full of flavor. Yeah. Tim, what do you think of this? I, I had my first one uh, yesterday morning. Okay. And uh, it was first cigar of the day. And? 
start up, I got, you know, a little bit of cedar to it. What I would most, what impressed me the most really was about the middle, the middle half. Okay. It's about and halfway through. I pulled, I pulled a lot of, uh, on a retro hill, definitely chocolate and coffee. And I, I have like a limited palate, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't, I smoke across the board, but my palate, I can't discern very fine flavors. I need rather bold. And the chocolatey coffee, middle portion of the cigar was absolutely wonderful. And in fact, it unfortunately led to the first adult beverage of the day, and it went downhill from there. What time was but- this? <laughs> Not that there's judgment, just what, what time of the day were you smoking? You said the first cigar of the day. 11.15. All right, so halfway <laughs> we, we through. We had just opened up. So you were pushing noon on that yeah. drink? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Considering during COVID, you know, it started at seven thirty. What did you say? All right, yeah, I was going to say, be, yeah, before COVID, what was your excuse? I guess. Well, you got to find you got to find a, a basically a place to to be at, and then you got to judge it from there. So as long as we just go off of when we were starting drinking the day during COVID, you're doing pretty good. And now you can use that forever, yeah, right? I mean, forever. That, that's where we're going. It's a standard. Ask just any attorney. We have precedent. Have you? Okay. <laughs> kind of want to know what attorney we're talking about and what the other story was, but uh, the one that drinks in my shop. Mm-hmm. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, I I like this cigar. I think uh, you know whether it's your first or or uh, towards the end of the day, it does have. I I get the cedar. There's a little bit of that cedar cedar cedary flavor. Cedar like cedar like sounds better. Cedar um, influenced. It's not really like a spice. I don't know, like in the retro hail, it's not a pepper. It's like a little bit of that, but there is a little bit of um, heat in the the retro hail in a, in a good way. Yeah, I can see that. You I know, can definitely see that. You get yeah. Um, anyone out there uh, listening live? If you guys have had this, because uh, it just landed, correct? Last week was the first round, and then this week so, was the second. Due to a few different situations, it basically the cigar sort of uh shipped out in phases. Mm-hmm. So this week we're seeing basically sort of like the final round go out to all the shops. So okay. it's been shipping over the last I would say 2 to 3 weeks. Yeah, the more retro hail I do on this, I, the more I get. I mean, it's it's a stout cigar. I mean, I think that's mm-hmm. where I get it where it's yeah. it's not just a straight medium, I don't think. I think this is Yeah, I think it's a good one. I think it's a good one for uh, you know, if you're definitely imbibing some some fluids. I'm going to try this right now. Why don't you try that right now? So we had a wiggle, uh, the Pennsylvania straight bourbon two weeks ago, as I mentioned, right off the rip. This is uh it's a, it's a step up, I'd say. Yeah. As for, as far as a more traditional rye whiskey, um, you know, compared to the bourbon whiskey that we had from, from the straight Pennsylvania. So, the two of them together, that actually, that pairs nicely right off mm-hmm. the rip yeah. for me. Um, anyone else have the rye in their cup, in their There's garage? Three. Just the three of us. There, there's some up here if somebody would like to partake. So what's the, the before we get into the whiskey even more, but I mean, with this Corinthian leather, I will say if you guys are in the Rust Belt, which is what again, what, what states, what territory? So in my territory, we the Rust Belt's going to be Indiana flowing into Ohio, okay. West Virginia, and Western Pennsylvania. And that's the only. That's it. That's, that's where it. The, that's where these yeah. are sold at. So, so for anyone outside of that area, hopefully our uh, our local customers at uh, our sponsor Tinderbox at Easton will take advantage of the special this week because it is in limited supply for sure. Um, are you guys sold out yet? Uh, not entirely. Not we, entirely. We, we have uh, so there was a few that were purposely withheld. Yeah. And then uh, you know just because of the situation of. Uh, when the cigar was being released, uh, not necessarily the easiest to sell a cigar in a pandemic. I don't get it. I don't know why. I can't figure out why. But yeah, yeah so it, it took a little longer than we would have liked to. But the good thing is the feedback that we got from yeah. consumers, from retailers, from everybody. You know, like I, w- I was at the box today and like literally Ronald Watt ran up to me and he's like, my man's in Cigar Fictionado. Like your name is there. <laughs> like he was like, I was excited. You know what I mean? Like, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, so no, it's very cool. Very yeah. cool. Um, but I was going to say, if you guys are outside of the Rust Belt, um, I know you can call us at Tinderbox at Easton. Um, oh, me. Call me <laughs> uh, and take advantage of it. You know, we got the the five packs again right now between now and next Tuesday. They're going to be uh, buy four, get one. Thank you very much. Uh, and then I don't know, Dirty Dogs, you guys. Uh, yeah, this? we just got them in. We uh, earlier this week, we started letting our 
you know, the dyed in the wool customers, the <laughs> the ones that we know we're going to like to try something new. We've gotten good returns on it so okay. far. Okay. But like everybody else, we're just now getting back to allowing people in the shop to sit. Yeah, how'd that go I'm for sure. you guys? Um. During the shutdown, <laughs> well, no. during the shutdown, it went well enough to pay the bills. We That's, did curbside pickup yeah, and delivery, yeah. you know, and we were very careful for our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, then a few weeks back here, Pennsylvania allowed us to sell, allowed people to come into the shop. And it's only been two weeks now, a few weeks, not yeah. even two weeks that we're allowed to use the lounge. But of course, we have to follow Social some distancing state guide distancing and, like and that, all yeah. that, you know. Uh, as of yet, I haven't seen anybody get up from smoking the cigar and put their mask back on to go to the bathroom, <laughs> which our governor wants. <laughs> Perfect. So you take it in with, with them to the bathroom, yeah, therefore then they, they don't then need to put their mask yeah. on. Yeah, I think they wash, wipe yeah. their hands with it. So it's very high gun. It's like leather cleaner. <laughs> um, good. <laughs> but uh, are you, do you guys ship at all, Dirty Dogs? Not really. Uh, not really. I mean, we try to do what we can for yeah. people, you know. Yeah. And I mean, believe me, if somebody call would call us, we'll make every effort we can to get it to you, and we'll talk to you about it at that point. Yeah. Right now, it's we don't know supply yet. We don't know what our customers because our customers are just starting to come back in. Yeah, you know, it gets a little scary when you get a six foot guy wants to hug you. You know <laughs> what I mean? And he's holding a bottle in his hand, and you know, a bottle of what? <laughs> anything. <All right. laughs> All right. just bottles. It's the you rust. You'll get people to just show up with bottles. So you play, like collecting rainwater. Um, we, we don't. Yeah, you, you have to understand. Out in the Pittsburgh area, since there's a lot of Eastern European, and that's what my background is. Mm -hmm. They have some stuff out in the Pittsburgh area called Schlivovitz, mm -hmm. and it comes from like Yugoslav, you know, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia. They all drink it. Yeah. Well, that whiskey's a little different. Yeah. You know, basically, you're looking at a country that was full of barbarians, you know, in its day. So it's high. And what proof. does a barbarian do when he gets drunk? He Fight? wants to cross another barbarian's border. He rapes the women and pillages the chickens. This but is in a Schlevo, Pittsburgh area? On Schlevo, you get that screwed up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that chicken hasn't talked to me in years. <laughs> Jesus. Explains a lot about Steeler fans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have Kevin King, who is now down in Florida. He's uh, going to call Tinderbox tomorrow. Try to get some Sweet. of these. So awesome! Thank have you, some Kevin. outside the rust rust belt. Uh, let's let's kind of switch over real quick to the uh, the whiskey here. Let's do it, um, and then we can talk more about the pairing and everything else. Is there anything else you want to share about Corinthian leather right now? I want to share it with everybody everywhere. That's nice. That's a nice sentiment. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to look at this bottle here first. Um, this It's Rye Rebellion spelled W-R-Y. Correct. Not, not a fan of that, but uh, I get it. This whiskey is made from a carefully curated blend of grain sourced as locally as possible and milled on site. Distilled in a copper pot in western Pennsylvania whiskey making tradition and bottled from small oak casks. This whiskey accents the pepper finish of rye with a hint of the sweet vanilla from wheat, further aged in bourbon barrels for at least four months, aged in new oak barrels for at least 12 months. So it sounds kind of young, but then the date on this says 6 14, 15. Correct. So have you had this for a while? Oh, or? yeah. Oh, so this has been well, Like I said, I'm, I'm not a... Yeah. For, yeah. From doing the podcast and stuff, you guys know I'm not a big bourbon or whiskey guy as far as right. like american whiskey and, and things of that nature um so this was get this was something where i had people that reached out to me from from ohio and they were looking for it yeah um so i picked some up and because i had a few people that wanted it, i was like well i gotta see what this is all about so i picked up a bottle for myself wiggle's kind of like really interesting i mean they're 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 definitely history nerds yeah. um so the the whole thing with uh wiggle was during like the whole rye rebellion he basically got into an altercation with a tax collector um that washington had sent um over you know the rye rebellion essentially yeah um and at one point he was actually sentenced to death to hang and he ended up getting a pardon for it uh, so that's the interesting the thing is thing. coming to this day um when they went to open up they actually went again into like lobbying and legislation sort of with with uh, the state government mm -hmm. to allow the model of on-site distillery sales. So they really? were actually really okay. big into that in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So matter of fact, when they opened up, 
the only whiskey you could get from them was clear whiskey. It was yeah. extremely young. I mean, yeah. So yeah, to see what they're coming with now, and that's what okay. I noticed when I watched <laughs> yeah. the one with Bentley. Yeah, and you guys were like, "Oh, this tastes young." They're they've basically been a pretty young operation, sort of the way they do things. And they've been transitioning to get yeah. more and more of that aging yeah. on things like that. And but wasn't Wiggle? You could buy small barrels too. Yes. And they had, they had so, yeah, they had choice of barrels, so you could age. I mean, if if you've only got a barrel that's a you know a gallon, it's going to age in a matter of months. You know, I think it's, it just it, tastes different. It, it's yeah, that's, that's what we were talking about a couple of weeks ago. And Tim, the big thing that... is their sourcing on how they mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Like, um, not to go too off topic, like they have one thing that I, I actually have come to really like. They have something called landlocked. Mm -hmm. And basically, when they were making all their spirits, they were like, we should make a rum. Well, the problem is you need sugar cane. That's not in Pennsylvania. Not a big Pennsylvania crop. No, not a big no. Pennsylvania crop. So that's where the idea for the name came from, landlocked. Yeah. So they basically used honey and essentially it's almost like a mead, but it does oh, okay. taste very much like a rum and it, it very distinct honey flavor. And that's out of the, the wiggle. That's out of the wiggle as well. As well. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're very interesting. Like I said, they're definitely history, uh, sort of, sort of buffs given, you know, what, what they decided to go with. Um, I know you have in front of you an email that I'd sent you. I actually reached out <laughs> to the company yesterday because yeah, that's what I'm looking at when right I now. plan to bring this out, looking for information on it again because i'm not technical on it it's very hard to find any information on i it. had a very difficult time as well so it's not your typical just couple you know google searches and you got it i give them a lot of props uh, i told them i was coming on a podcast i want to speak a little bit more about you know what it was or be a little bit more knowledgeable because i'm sure you guys had some questions and, absolutely uh, so they were, they were actually really cool in 24 hours they gave us a, a response that i think was very technical at least on on my aspect and and sort yeah. of specific so I figured to give that to you, that would be the best way to do it. Well, and that's what is interesting with this one, because they kind of built off of the, um, what is it? The, uh, how do you even say that? The Manan. Monongahela. Yeah. You make it sound good. Fuck yeah. Uh, it's a river. That is a river. Uh, so they, they use that in this, it says. Um, so it's 90% of that, 10% Allegheny wheat whiskey. Each age for minimum minimum of one year in 10 and 15 gallon barrels, as, yeah. as Tim was saying, uh, smaller barrels blended together and barreled in used 53 gallon wild turkey bourbon barrels for an additional four months. And it's bottled, as, as it says on there, 84 proof. Uh, the mash bill for this whiskey, 72 percent rye, 13 percent wheat, 15 percent organic two row malted barley. Okay, so those are all actually organic, organic rye, organic wheat, organic two-row malted barley. But because they finished it in that wild turkey used barrel, this is not certified organic, which that other one did have organic. I, I believe you guys uh, were talking about that. Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Because you had the organic uh, uh, Pennsylvania, orator. Yeah. You had the organic orator, uh, Josh Bentley on. Josh Bentley. So if there's something organic, you tell you about it. He's all about it. He's, He's all, all about, about it. it. No, but I, it's interesting uh, that they use that process. But once again, those smaller barrels, I don't know if that finished. And you guys are now trying it, Nate and Shannon. Um, you guys are trying it. Nate goes, I drank it. <laughs> like, just, it's, it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> so, in in comparison, I guess, it's totally different, right? From yeah. the, uh, the Wiggle uh, Pennsylvania straight bourbon. But in comparison, when I, what I mean, do you know, do you remember what you paid for this or what it, it goes? I want to say it was around the sixty, yeah, fifty, sixty, something like that. So about the same price as the other one, from what we understand. I this is a little bit more, uh, your speed. yeah, more my speed, yeah, yeah. more more what I I would expect from a, a rye whiskey. I, I I'm surprised reading that that description that it was the smaller barrels and it was the you know that mash bill being that high in, in the corn, um, but. I think it actually has some nice flavors yeah, to it. What do you guys I, think? I wasn't, I'm not normally a rye whiskey fan, mm -hmm. or at least I wasn't until about a year ago. I, we started getting a lot of guys coming into the shop, you know, since we can BYOB. Yeah. There's guys coming in, bringing odd stuff. And I started getting into it because I had rye when I was really young, but it was rough in those days. You know, yeah. rye was a rough whiskey. And this, and I, and I can taste the, I really think that I can tell that that was a bourbon barrel. Yeah. There. It's got that, it, it mellows it out. It's got a nice cream. I don't, I guess creamy isn't right for Well, no, I mean, even a, yeah, no, you can have that. I think that's where that vanilla yeah, note that, maybe that, comes in. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, I mean, it's it's not as much of the uh, normal like I don't know like spice as a as a normal rye yeah. that I'm used to, but it has nice flavor. What do you think, Ryan? I mean, well, you've, and you've that's had, the interesting some thing of is like I, I'm not you know obviously I've had it for five years at this point. And I've not down the bottle, but I I don't drink this stuff yeah usually. And the ironic thing was you know during COVID when obviously we're doing a lot more of these video chats and yeah. stuff. You guys would get done with bourbon and BS and just to sort of be one with the crowd. That was actually the bottle I would crack That's and, the one, and huh? sort of sip it while I was bullshitting with you guys. <laughs> but I, I'm actually a fan of it. I do like it. Yeah. Nate, you guys want to get on there and, and give a little bit of feedback on that as well, please? Because I'm interested to, to see. This is one, unfortunately, you know, I don't think many people, many listeners will be able to right. uh, get their hands on. But again, I'm, and we're not trying to pump it. I mean, you guys coming from the Pittsburgh area. Yeah. Uh, Josh Bentley from from Altidus, well, he then, was out there. He brought it back, and that was sort of the 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 what when we talked about this earlier, and Steve made the comment like I was upset that Josh brought it on. It wasn't that I was upset that uh, Josh brought it on. It was more or less like, okay, so yeah, it was. But no, when when we had sort of talked about this idea of like, what if we do the podcast? We feature the Corinthian leather. We smoke it because it's a cigar that I made. Not to sound like a fucking ego driven asshole, but. I was like, all right, so we'll do like a little bit more like me stuff. Like instead of, you know, normally we we do Hudson and stuff like that because we're affiliated yeah. with them. Yeah. I was like, this would be cool. Bring something that I drank from Pittsburgh. Bring that in. You know, I brought an old guy from Pittsburgh, too. So, you know, we, we got I, I went all Pittsburgh on age you know, longer than the whiskey. Fake. He's aged longer than the whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hell, his fake arm is aged longer than the whiskey. I mean, it, we, <laughs> we, uh, so <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad it, thing? I feel it like. still works. Is, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, what's the warranty on that? And no. you, you can always sterilize the hook with, yeah, with good whiskey. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So that that was sort of my so mindset. And then out. when I when I had seen the bourbon to BS thing come up and it said wiggle whiskey, I'm like, God damn it! Like I was like, this is gonna be something <laughs> different. I wanted to bring in that would be cool. And uh, yeah, and like I said, I I heard you guys talk about it and like. I don't want to say like you guys were negative about it, but I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I think that we could at least get another sort of showing of this out there that I think would be dramatically more positive because like I said, I did have people from Ohio. I know you guys are crazy on your bourbons, your whiskeys out here. I had people from Ohio reach out to me. Can you get this for me? So yeah, like, the there one? has to be some, this one. Oh, this one. Yeah. So I said, there has to be something to this, you know what I yeah. mean? So that, that's why I thought it'd be cool to bring it on tonight and have that with, with the cigar that, I no, I think it. it's a great choice. Uh, in fact, Nate, go ahead if you if you want about what you think of the uh, the whiskey. I I definitely enjoy this a lot more than uh, yeah. the bourbon that we had a couple weeks ago. Uh, definitely get a little bit of vanilla, a lot of oak up front, and I do get just a little bit of spice. But I think that's more from using the that barrel, uh, the yeah, the uh, wild, wild turkey. turkey barrel yeah. than anything. Because in terms of the flavor, it, it actually tastes uh, light and bright. Yeah. Like it, it, uh, it kind of reminded me a little bit of that Masterson's rye, okay. which that was a hundred percent rye, but that was also a 10 year, but it tasted light for what you would expect for a hundred percent rye. This to a 10 year rye. Yeah. But th I mean, it kind of reminded me of that just with how light and bright the, the flavor profile was on the palate. Yeah. Shannon, you had some, right? Yeah. I just had a little bit, but kind of along those lines. You're, yeah. In the same boat there. Kind of light, very light. What do you think of the uh, Corinthian leather? Are you smoking that? Yeah, this is this is actually the second one I smoked. Yeah. Um uh, first one I had was a couple weeks ago when Ryan popped in the shop and uh gave you and I That's one. That's right, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. uh I actually walked up to the uh to the humidor and was looking at all the other Alec Bradleys that we had on the shelf. I looked at Ryan and I was like, "You know what? Of all the Alec Bradleys we have on the shelf right now, this is this would be my favorite one of of what we have cuz I just really enjoyed the flavor and uh also the complexity. Yeah, like it had a, it had a little bit more spice at the beginning, then it kind of mellowed out in the middle of it, and then there at the end it picked back up again, and just uh, had a, had a ton of flavor, uh, kind of like a this don't take this the wrong way, like a dry almost floral note to it without not floral like the you know infused type floral. No, no, I know what you're saying. Just just you know just that flavor profile it. And it, it tasted really good. I enjoyed the flavor. It was very different. The The amusing thing was, I remember specifically giving you that cigar. One, because of the feedback you gave me, which was very unique. And thank you again. I, I, I That was awesome to hear. It, and I'm glad you meant it. Um, but like the funny thing was, I gave you the cigar and you were smoking it and you got really quiet. 
And then you're like, how much does this go for on the shelf? And I gave you the price point and like your eyes sort of like bulge out of your head. And that's when you walked away and looked at the humidor. Yeah. And like when your eyes popped out of your head, I'm like, oh man, he does not think this is worth the money. <laughs> well, <laughs> like, well, the, I thought it was a bundle of cigars. Yeah, like, like what, two well, fifty, three bucks? Care for no, it. The, like, no, the exact word I, when I first lit it up, I was like, there's this weird note that I'm getting, but that was only because I was, I, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah I do remember. Yeah, that. I, I, I knew like it, about that too. Like I knew in my mind. <laughs> really good yeah, that was the first yeah. feedback. This is I, weird. I, so like, weird. Yeah. Well, flavor. no, it was because the the flavor note that first popped in my head when I first started smoking about the first inch of the cigar. I was like, this is kind of what it tastes like, but that's kind of a weird note. Mm-hmm. And you know, so I was like, what I was, was like, it? You you ended up saying what it was? It was something like it was he like held on. He held out. It was like rather. it was like raisin. I held out for a while. It was like raisin or something no, weird. Like, no, it, it was it was like a it was like a potpourri soap. But that's what it was, potpourri soap. And I'm like, yeah, don't put that on the package. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wanted to <laughs> flavors. It's also a secret. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask. Don't ask. Don't ask. No Persian lie. No Persian lie. <laughs> Go, and so Sean's over here. He's drinking Guinness Stout, right? Uh, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, he says that it goes really, really well with the uh, Guinness as well. Cocoa type, yeah. Deep flavors. Yeah. I, I, I think this would sit well with anything with a heavier flavor, whether it's beer. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to trying it with like a dark, Central American rum too. I'm kind of thinking that might be pretty good. Yeah, it might be the brightness, like that, uh, the lighter flavors too. Yeah, a little sweetness, like you were talking Off about, Ryan. The other way, yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, I like it. What do you guys, uh, Tim? Did you? What do you think of this? I mean, you you enjoyed it? I, I do. Like I said, I, I I only recently, within the last year, have I been drinking much rye at all. Mm-hmm. Primarily, I used to be a single malt scotch drinker, islands, young, mm-hmm. very, po- I need that, you know, open Punch. the cork and smell the smoke yeah. a half a block yeah. away. <laughs> um, then I got into this business and I started after a trip to Nicaragua and getting turned on to the Central American rums. I started, really got hooked on them. Nice. And in the last year or so, like I said, guys have been coming into shop that are real bourbon and rye aficionados. They know what they're talking about. And I've been going... Oh, here's a world I missed, and I'm sure it's going to go downhill from there again, too. You know, <laughs> it's that well, crossing a border thing. No, you know? no, yeah, nothing but time, right? <laughs> well, well, what do you guys think? Where are we at here? We're still pretty early, but uh, what do you guys think of the pairing? I actually think it goes pretty well together. I do too. Um, yeah. th- th- there's definitely, to me, the big thing is there's there's a balance to it. Um, it it's kind of like the way Alan, when he talks about the way he does pairings, like he likes it to be something where you, you smoke the cigar and it, you, you try what you're pairing it with mm-hmm. and the pair, you know, the alcohol makes the cigar sort of stand out. But then when you go back to the cigar, the cigar makes sort of the alcohol. Yeah. Stand yeah, out. yeah. I, I feel like there's that really good back and forth. Back and this. forth. Yeah, I agree. I can see that. I think that's about the only way I, I, my, business partner my stepson one of my two business partners he's got one of those palettes you know where he can he can just pair everything i mean he know he's just got that palette that matches yeah i don't i'm i'm <laughs> i have to like <clears throat> i have to really tear a flavor apart in my head you know i don't get obvious notes really have to think about it i have to i have to really think about it you know but i do kind of agree with ryan if I taste one and then taste the other and then go back and I've noticed three different flavors, mm-hmm. now I know I've got something that I like. Okay. You know? Yeah. I, I'm at that halfway almost point that you were talking. You're, you're beyond me, I think. I'm you guys that, are but- <laughs> You're, it definitely, me, but yeah, I'm but it, it definitely builds a bit. Mm-hmm. Why do you want to, why did you want to go through Rice's Cubanas? I know you're talking about the Honduran tobacco and everything else, but the other, the other uh, three, are through J Fuego, They're correct? Through J Fuego, which correct. is another factor that Alec Bradley uses quite Absolutely. a bit. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but why Rice's Cubanas, which is from the 1940s, if I remember? Yeah, yeah. I, so Rice is, is like not not to get like deep and and weird, but like it, weird. it's kind of like a very mystical place. Uh, <laughs> mystical is the word I'm going to use. 
it, it there's there's something about it like it, the funny thing is like you know a lot of us uh at alec bradley like we're, we're friends with matt booth yeah. and and some of us more so than others like i know matt we recognize each other we we have a good time whatever but like like miss school with, like with the boys and willy stuff, wonka like, yeah yeah Matt's absolutely booth. okay uh the boys are are particularly close with matt they like to talk to him and stuff like that and uh matt actually recently was down in rice's kubas yeah. and he said something that's very interesting that i feel a lot of the reps when we left we we sort of shared the same sentiment and for us it, it's more true but to hear somebody like matt who really doesn't do anything with rice's visit the factory and sort of say that it just feels like home there's something about it very welcoming yes yeah it, it's the atmosphere it's the people um the one thing i love about rice's is um you know they they all have like these like very flamboyant sort of like polo shirts that they wear and from what i understand like like they, bright colors yeah Hawaiian like they'll, they'll have like a really bright like a blue or they'll have like a really bright red or like an yeah. orange or something like that and from what i understand they they often wear them home instead of you know changing there with the tobacco stuff okay and, and from what i understand it's like a very big thing of pride with them they're mm -hmm. very happy to, to come to work there and they love the environment and being down there and like being able to sort of take uh take part and witness some of their traditions and, and their customs and just the way they treated us and everything. It was just absolutely amazing. Like, like nice. there, there's some photos of Alan. Now there's some of Matt um, where there was right at the main entrance going into the rolling area. Yeah. There's this huge white marble floor. They only put that in when they heard the sales reps were coming down. Wow. And like, literally if we were to walk through there, there would be four people that came out and they, they would make that floor meticulously white every time we would for walk you through. guys anytime we would walk through and, and we would it was to the point the sales reps would feel bad because we would walk down and be like oh, i forgot something like we walk back up and then they just, just leave it just leave it yeah like just leave it you really need your headphones right now no no it's fine it's fine you know like it, but like the, just their level of care like like the one the one really cool thing that we got to see was um so uh ugo is the main guy down there his mother is still involved okay and his mother i want to say is like 80s or 90s and she comes down on the rolling floor at some points in the day and they'll play like Latin music and she'll go down there and she'll dance. And it's funny, like when she walks by and she dances, like all the rollers will take their uh, chivetas and they will, they'll bang them on a thing and they'll, they'll cat call her sort of like whistle and stuff like that. Can't, and like, can't and, do that here. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it, you can't do that here. You can't do that here. You can't do that. Not here. anymore. And that's why it's home. That's <laughs> uh, but no, it, like I said, it was just a really cool experience. I mean, there there was just something awesome about it. it oh it, yeah, it's very welcoming, and it, it, obviously now you have identity with it. You know, mm -hmm. that, that it's a place you want to go back. Uh, I did want to throw up here. Uh, Let's not throw it throw up. up, but um, Avi asked, and I know Nate, you uh, you put it on the feed, but uh, for those listening and and not looking at the comments, can Ryan run? Well, tell us again about the wrapper filler binder and aging time on this cigar. So your wrapper is going to be there. Your wrapper is going to be Honduran from the Trojes region. Your binder is going to be uh, Honduran Nicaraguan double binder. And then your filler is going to be Honduran Nicaraguan. Aging time. You're, you're probably looking at a pretty standard aging time with us. I want to say you're probably floating around maybe like six months or so. Okay. That's yeah. Once it's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wrapper leaf, probably more, I'd imagine. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about the component. I'm talking about cigars. Yeah. yeah. Once it's sitting. Yeah. And then uh, Abby also asked uh, to you, Tim, when you were talking about rums, would you think that uh, Zacapa? Yeah, this this cigar would go well with Zacapa rum. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. I figured that yeah. was the answer. I, I, my favorite rum. I I'm a little partial to uh, Nicaragua's Flor de Cane. Oh yeah, it's good and, stuff. Uh, like the seven and twelve year olds, you know, I like them. Rums. Um. Yeah, rum, <laughs> rum, rum. Can't rums. talk about that either. Rum. Uh, <laughs> can't, can't do that rums. here. <laughs> can't do that here either it, it, you, people run it's, away with people's words these days i i just feel like it's very important it's gonna be on twitter now. you know we were talking about the <laughs> about pairing with this and all of us we agreed like like you like the the uh um with the guinness and we just yeah. said we thought this pairing was good but now that you mention it you know this might be something if you've ever had you know like a sweet dessert with espresso Mm -hmm. this might be the espresso and there's i don't know i would like to try it with something that is i don't like mean a like a liqueur oh, but something that's no, definitely but... got some sweetness to it 
like might creme be brulee it, dessert or no? Well, kind of no. I mean, kind of like have this with something uh, with a, with a liquor that is sweet, also, which is a little opposite of what we all or say, like a sweet on. mixed drink, like a but it might Manhattan be Manhattan or something. Exactly, it might be nice to try that offset. See, yeah, now I'm thinking of like a uh, an Irish coffee. Almost. Oh, that would be killer. You yeah, know what I mean, like with like I think some, that'd be some killer. Jameson or Tullamore Dew, you know, yep. you know, nice good black coffee. Yep. Where you, that, you've coffee. got that same coffee. basic, you know, earthier, yeah. deeper flavor, yeah. and then you got the sweetness to highlight. It might be pretty good. I'd like to try it. Well, now you know what to try when you get back home. <laughs> I got a couple things we could tap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the time I'd say on part one uh, that we we've already kind of talked about it, but let's do the the rating here. Um, the, so we, we do, Tim, uh, out of 10, you rate the cigar, you rate the, uh, the drink, and then you rate the pairing talked about it. We've kind of danced around it all, but as far as if you were to give it a rating out of 10 and, uh, I'll put you on there first, Tim cigar whiskey, and then the pairing, how would you rate this and why uh, the cigar? I'd, I'd give it a nine, nine. I really 10. would. I, I, it, it's, more, this is. Knowing the price points on it and everything, yeah. it is well worth it. I wouldn't feel, I would not feel guilty about smoking this at any time. Yeah. Uh, the whiskey, a nine. I, and that's because I have my my own personal partialities to certain things. You sure. Know? Yeah. And the pairing is definitely a 10. I, I, I think the pairing is very good. That's strong. Yeah. That's strong. Yeah. Ryan, I, oh, I could do this. You could do this. Yeah. You could do this every day. Yeah. He's driving. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> well, all right. Set up the guest bedroom. Uh, Ryan. I'm nines across the board. Nines across the nines board. Nines across the board. So you have your own cigar nine. I knew you were going to say this. I'm just asking. These are just questions. It's part of my job. You got to stay humble. That's you got to stay saying. humble. Yeah. So you give it a 10 if you weren't humble. Probably. Jesus. If, if uh, I if, if I wasn't humble and I gave the cigar a five, I'd give it a ten. I mean yeah, there you go. There you go. So nine, nine, and then the pairing and nine. Um for me, the cigar, so at our shop, so it's just gonna be like nine, ten dollar range. On our shelf, yeah. we have it nine ninety five. Um, I think you might be, I don't know, Pennsylvania. We're a little under because we have no tax no, no state. No tax. tobacco tax in, in Pennsylvania. So you what are you like nine, eight fifty? I think we're probably about 850. 850. Yeah. So sub $10 is is kind of the the yeah. key there, I mm -hmm. think. Um so for a limited edition cigar, now granted, I mean this is not necessarily like a limited edition that's like, you know, 20-year-old wrapper leaf or anything like right. that. You know, it's not right. anything like that. This is yeah. just a a first edition. This is a starting point. I love the project. You know, I would give this cigar definitely in that that eight to nine as well. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, it's a it's a great cigar at nine ninety five on our shelf or even less than than nine dollars on a shelf. It's to to Nate's point earlier, I would say that this is going to stack up against anything almost mm -hmm. from from Alec Bradley. No, it, it's I had a few guys that that know me that are consumers, and you know, like them hearing i was coming out with my own cigar and all that stuff like you know there, there's obviously a lot of ball busting stuff like yeah, that right. and then you have guys where they're texting and you're like yeah, this cigar is not a fucking joke yeah like, this is no, like a real cigar and i'm like oh no like this, this isn't just some bullshit like we're throwing my name on like you yeah, know it's, it, it's a legit cigar I feel like you said I'm, bullshit for a reason the bs project but it was yes was that was that, was that a dig <laughs> what <laughs> And we're going to go off camera for a minute here. No. <laughs> so for the whiskey, I'm going to give this one an eight. Uh, well, seven to eight. I like it a lot. I think this is something. Once you hit that uh, close to $60 mark, it's it's tough. Absolutely. I, I agree with that 100%. <laughs> um, I will say, like I said, I, I hate to keep going back to what, what Josh brought from, from Wiggle. I, get it. Uh, I would like to try more now from, from the Wiggle Distillery. Uh, we talked about it on the previous episode with the Wiggle uh, Pennsylvania straight bourbon is that it reminded me a lot of some of the Ohio distilleries um, that are doing things with the smaller barrels. They're kind of changing the process. It's not your traditional 53 gallon barrels that are sitting for, you know, three, four years, you know, so you're going to get, I think, different flavors. I do know when Wiggle came on the scene, they were very, very high on education. Um, you know, now they, they have their own facility open stuff. So I'm sure they're still like that, but it's more there, but, they were pretty active about like when cigar shops reached out to them doing stuff with cigar shops. So yeah. 
I think in the future, you know, if that's something that you were interested in, you could probably reach out to them. I'm yeah. sure they'd do something with you. No, I think it's very cool. Their their outlet when they had it in the strip and everything mm-hmm. too, you could go in there as a total whiskey idiot, and they would treat you like a good cigar shop would treat you. Yeah. yeah. Let, Open let arms. Me tell you, you got it. And then bust your balls probably a little bit. Yeah. 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 No, you don't bust balls as much if you don't know the person. Once you get to know the person, <laughs> after sure. about five minutes. Well, and especially when you don't know them and then you get them drunk, you don't bust their balls. <laughs> I don't know. That I don't know if I can agree with. No. Uh, Nate was asking, was Ryan going for a 9 to $10 cigar? How much input on the price did you have? Uh, so price, we actually had a lot of control on. Um and I think that was the big thing with the with 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 the reps. We basically all decided to go around sort of that same price point just yeah. because we understood the nature of the business and coming to the to the cigar world with a cigar from a guy that comes in and sells you cigars. And I, I think that's something with with anything, just because you do A doesn't mean you know B. And I think it was important to us to be able to have it at an affordable price point that people could yeah. reach for it and get it. And, you know, also at the same time, we're not discounting what was done. You know, it, I, we did, uh, we did an Alec Bradley power hour with uh, the guys that made their own cigars and Alec and Bradley, which was really cool. Um, and one of the things that like, I, I made it very clear to address was I'm some gringo that's never rolled or, or, or blended a cigar before. But when you're working with the factories and the people that we were and the people that had their hands on it, like the project couldn't fail. It was just a matter of our own way of going about it. You know, some of the reps blended for something that, you know, I, I took a unique approach in learning about the blending process, which yeah. was when we went to these factories and we were given a ton of tobacco. And that's where you, that's how you started it when you right. were down there. right? Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that that's where this sort of all stemmed from was, yeah. was the guys were really getting into it and, you know, the, the reps were given a chance to do it. And like a lot of us just kept doing it like over and over and over. Were you smoking like the, the Puritos as, oh, you, as you guys call them, you know, and yeah, when we do the, there's Alec Bradley event that uh, you guys were doing the deconstruction, um, the deconstruction events. Uh, and this was happening obviously for the last several years. Yeah. You guys would do this. Yeah, We still do. And for those of you that don't know what it is, uh, basically you, you get, you don't know what cigar it is necessarily. You go to an event and they have, three Puritos. One is a wrapper leaf. One is, and then it's like a little small cigarillo almost. Absolutely. One's wrapper leaf, one's binder, and one is uh, part of the filler, but they're labeled one, two, and three. And then, you know, Ryan or someone else will be able to walk you through, you know, all right, light up number one, light up number two. Now, now smoke those two together, light up number three and, and so on. And then you kind of end up with the three little Puritos all at the same time. Right. And uh, it's an education thing that I think is really cool. That is that how you guys did it? Is that how you picked the, the wrapper leaf? Or did you go in there with um, kind so, of an idea that this is my overall so we, idea? And then they kind of gave you an accelerated We model. all took different approaches to it. Okay. You know, some of us were heavy on Puritos. Some of us were heavy on what sort of we knew about the properties of the tobacco. Some of us were more, well, we just want to mix this together and see what happens. You know, the one thing that I did that I, I think was unique compared to the other reps was I didn't necessarily go down there and say, I want to create my own thing. The first thing I did was like, well, what do I know that goes into an Alec Bradley cigar? Can I try to make that cigar to understand the process better? Okay. Um, so, um, and you've done enough of those Purito events too, absolutely. the construction events. So that, that's an education for absolutely. you at that point, absolutely. you know? And, uh, you know, I, I, there's, a, there's a joke, like when we talk about the guys that were involved in the blending process, you know, it was, it was mainly the boys and, and, and Ralph. Um, and at one point I was, I was, I joked around about, there's also a partial credit to, uh, Eddie Ortega. Uh, really? yeah, because he, he, he works with us now and That's we, right. we were actually down at Placentia. And, uh, at one point I was looking, I, I was trying to basically make sanctum because I saw some Colombian tobacco and I'm like, I wonder if I can make a sanctum. So really? I started messing around with it and I'm trying to figure out how much Colombian tobacco I should use. Just a and, touch. And I'm looking for Ralph and I can't find Ralph anywhere. And I'm looking for the boys. And, you know, we were, we were kind of breaking up doing like individual meetings and stuff like that while some of us were blending. So the boys weren't available. And I see Eddie Ortega and I'm like, oh, man, like Eddie Ortega blends cigars. Like he he could tell me something. This guy knows about cigars. Yeah, this guy knows about cigars. So 
I wave Eddie over and he comes over and he goes, what's going on, bro? What's going on? And I'm like, I'm like, Eddie, what can you tell me about Colombian tobacco? He goes, don't fucking use it, bro. And I was like, <laughs> all right, well, I'm not making anything anymore. So I just <laughs> set it down and, you know, went to making something else. You sat yeah. down yeah. quietly. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, all right, well, so all much right. for my dreams. But, you know, I want to go home. Yeah. But <laughs> so he gets a partial credit because there's no Colombian tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. Um, so on the pairing, I would I would give this uh, as far as the other ratings going back to that uh, the pairing, I would give it a, a eight to nine. I think this does. I agree with yeah. you guys. This these two go really well. Solid. Together. I just poured because there's not a whole lot left of the the Wiggle Rye Rebellion. Uh, the Four Roses Small Batch because I do want to actually try it. That's one of my yeah kind of a, a more of a go to yeah go to every day kind of go to. I know I can get it on the shelves here in Ohio. Sure. So I'm interested to try it with that. It's got I think a little bit more spice to it than the uh, Rye Rebellion, but uh, I'm interested to try that. I think I think it's a great pairing. I want to learn more a little bit about that process, maybe in part two, if it comes up, on, on where you might be going as far as your chapters in life. I think there might chapters be... Chapters of the cigar, chapters in life. That's right. And this is chapter one, right? Isn't that what you call it? Uh, yeah. Edition one. Edition one? Edition one. Which is kind of interesting. When they first came out, everybody made the comment, they're like, they kind of look like little books, like the packaging and stuff like you that. You can so. use that. Uh, you can't use chapter one. Yeah. We learned that from the Florida Dominicana. Yeah. That's that's a valid point. <laughs> we'll stick with edition. Yeah, Avi did ask, did we, you design it? You yeah, like, so we, he, we, he knows you like photography. Do you take the picture on the box or is it photoshopped? In that's, will? that's all Photoshop. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we have an awesome graphic designer that we work with. Um, he was basically given sort of some ideas of like, hey, this is what we're going for. He went to work on it. And uh, the stuff that he came out up with was awesome. But when I saw this packaging, I was like, I, I kind of really dig this. Like, it kind of had like e even just like the the choice of the fonts and stuff like that. Like, it very much had that like sort of old school like oh very feel much so. to it. And then I like what what like the the idea of like the movie sort yeah. of quotations on the back. Well, on the bottom it says an American success story. Right. I like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. So it, it was reminds me of Scarface a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we we had we had a few guys that you know they came up with with their naming and and why they did it and you know like I said th this was something where Alan's a big proponent of you know when we do uh, meetings and stuff like that he always says like the territory managers manage their territories treat it like it's your business I like that and I think this was sort of another way of basically getting that through to the reps and not only the reps, but, but to the retailers as well. Like, yeah, we, we give these guys a lot of sort of leeway with doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I think anytime you can sell the passion of a cigar, I think a lot of people, we've taken people like on cigar tours and stuff to Nicaragua and everything. And it's amazing to watch somebody that has never seen what it takes to really develop a cigar. When from they get seed down to, there and, yeah. and see everybody from the farmers mm -hmm. to the, the people, the rollers, everybody in the factories. If you go into certain factories, you can feel the passion. And when we would take guys down there and they would see that for the first time, yeah, they, they would be like, wow, how can I be smoking this cigar for 10 bucks? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hundreds of hands that go into this from seed to... Mm -hmm. And I think, cigar, I think really. when, you, when you get the opportunity to like educate people on that kind of stuff, and we, we've seen it when we've done the deconstruction events, yeah. like from going shop to shop, the, the thing that I like seeing most is the guy that almost like got his arm twisted to show up to this thing. Yeah. And by the time it's over, he's the guy that's asking all the questions about what's going on. You know, like, how does this work? How does that? That's what I like seeing. And, and I think that's something that, you know, in a lot of industries, ours included, you don't always get that educational factor, you know. We, no, and we, I, I think that's any product, right, that we, we almost take for granted. Yeah. You know, um, you know, cell phones are sitting there. Yeah. You know, to think about the R&D that went into it and how it's progressed and then like all the actual uh, nuts and bolts that go into it, all the hands that touch it, whether it be from the R&D side or it's actually the factory side, how it all pieces together. Cars are the same way. We take it for granted and anymore. I, I can't remember what the term is, but like they talk about it. Like, for instance, I, I think an example not to pick on them and I'm not entirely sure. So don't take this as gospel. But I think it was like the ring doorbells. There's yeah. a lot of people that were like upset about some sort of like, well, they're, they're not as secure as they could be or whatever. And I can't remember what the term is, but there's basically something where, sure, we can put this stuff into the product, 
but the usability of it all of a sudden just drops dramatically. Yeah. So yeah. there's like a barrier of entry where the education, sure, we could educate you, but a lot of people don't want to do that. Yeah, you're going to be calling an IT guy to set up your your doorbell. Right. Basically. You know, and, and I think that's kind of like that with cigars. There's a lot of guys that just – we've talked about it in Tim's shop working there. He has a lot of customers that smoke great cigars, and they know great cigars, but they couldn't tell you why it's great or what yeah. about it, you know. But they do know – good cigars they just couldn't tell you anything about it well again i think that's it's going back to tim's point when you go down there when you get if you guys have the opportunity to go to any <clears throat> tour any tour any nicaragua tour. honduras dominican republic um you know you hear ryan talk about, about the rice cabanas factory i mean you get you get an impact there if you can go out to the fields i've been not unfortunately to those yet i was down in cuba and i've been to the fields in connecticut um with altidus and it doesn't matter just seeing the field seeing the the raw product and then seeing the steps that go into it from field to the barn to the fermentation and then you know obviously going to a factory and seeing people manipulate that to a point where it is an assembly line at that point because of the r d which is what you did on this one right. ryan is that you had that r d where you're like all right this is the design this is what i want out of the cigar you trial and error a little bit you know you know what you want to start with but did you go through a lot of blends? I, I forgot to ask that. Yeah. So ultimately, by the time we got the major components figured out, we probably went through, I want to say maybe about five blends. Yeah. Like, like that's a low blends. number, honestly. Yeah. So yeah. when you're going mass quantity, like a, like this is a, a, a limited edition, this is edition one. But when you're going with it, I know uh, Ricky Rodriguez talks about it when he's been on the podcast from CIO. When he is developing, he wants to do a lot of different things. But when he's developing a CAO product, for example, much like when, when you know, Alec and Bradley and Alan and, you know, anything that you might do in the future, if there's going to be a mass release, you've got to be able to produce basically a million plus cigars. So not only do you have to come up with your blend, but you have to make sure that you have to have that much wrapper leaf. You and, have to have and, that and much still, component leaf. Not that it wasn't a, a, a larger number, but, you know, being down at the factory and, you know, being able to be like, all right, this tobacco, this tobacco, this tobacco, and then you take it over to a guy and he rolls it right there for yeah. you and you smoke it. You know, we went through several of those too. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the interesting Finished thing product. was the way this project happened of the fact that like, okay, we were down there for a week and now we go home. Yeah. You know, how do we continue this project? And it was a lot of like, okay, you know, and, and who, that being said, I don't know if Alec and Bradley and Ralph, they might've smoked several. Cause like, you know, they gave me, a sample and they say what do you think and i smoke it and i go i like it i feel like maybe yeah. the, the the retro hill is a little rough like what can we do so i don't know if they're smoking three and then they're going okay this is the one that we think is good and then they send that to me you know because like i said the, I, the project of me going home and then doing this essentially from pittsburgh yeah um you know and anybody that's been a sharp eye on my social media they've seen over the last year some of these blend codes and stuff yeah. like that of me smoking different things like that that's all been a part of it so you know on my end once i got back to pittsburgh there were about five cigars that that we had gone back and forth there's a lot that goes into it and then having someone i know alec and bradley are really getting into it. having a guy like like ralph with you guys um we had similar experiences with the bs gold originally yeah uh, and also the bs silver it was you're dealing with people that you can give them that type of feedback right, right? and then they take your translation and i don't i don't say something like Hey, will you add this filler leaf? No, it's right. literally it's all based on you know my you know and Brian you know we would just say we like what you're saying we like the spice. Can you amp it up a little bit? Right. Can you take away this a little bit? And you're you're kind of talking of more even, from even a even cigar. You and Brian smoker. talking like, does that make sense? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you know that going back and forth. And like a lot of them are like, this, yep. you know, yeah, yeah. They might be bullshitting you a little bit, but right. like, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Smoke this one now. You're yeah. like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I meant. They're like, good, thank As God. I pull it out of my pocket. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is I, I'm actually impressed that it tastes the way it does with, you know, basically working with about five different blends. I mean, when I started hearing how many blends that they get, you know, per per sale, you know what I mean? Per cigar. Per project. Yeah. Choice. yeah. And again, my feedback, not not to cut Tim off, my feedback is important if my name's on it but that being said also least experience doing this so like yeah. i said the amount of blends that maybe when i say make this adjustment they're smoking blends going okay let's send this to him and see what he thinks of this one you know i i think i'd be willing to say that there was probably more iterations of them smoking stuff in between me smoking it just to 
Well, I think, again, you say your name's on it. But, I mean, again, this is, like you said, you're the new guy. Very accurate on the box, right? Yeah. You know, and, and you, you sp- spoke very highly of what Alan says. You know, you, you handle it like it's your business. But you are, at this point, the, the, the fine print guy. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> that still says Alec Bradley on the label. In all fairness, Ralph's name's never on any of them. <laughs> it's, it's in the fine print now. It's in fine print now. It's in the fine print now, and he's going to be talked about more and more. Uh, so for part one, I want to thank you guys for being here. I want to thank um, you. I really enjoyed the cigar. I, I always appreciate everyone. you providing me with an ashtray and glassware. You know it. You guys you know are it. top notch around here. You he's know. not used to using glasses. <laughs> yeah. Just the bottle. It's made of glass. Uh, but I do want to thank you, Tim, as well. And I want thank to you. encourage everyone that if you're listening to uh, this on uh, the audio side on, on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or anything like that, um, to tune into part two. Uh, I got to look at what we're actually calling it. It's something about chapters of our life. Chapters of life. Chapters Cha- of life. Should have named it like that, that soap opera. You know? Chapters of our lives. Chapters of our lives. Uh, chapters of life. We're going to get into a little bit about uh, Tim's history, which I'm looking forward to because I we've just met tonight. So I'm, I, I know a little bit about you. Ryan, I know, like I said, a little bit more about you. But um, Tinderbox at Easton, thank you for uh, supplying us by way of Alec Bradley and Ryan Ponis, the uh, Corinthian leather at Tinderbox at Easton, our sponsor. It's buy four, get one. So you're going to get one of these uh, – Five pack boxes, basically for around forty dollars, yeah, yeah. uh, thirty nine ninety five, basically on our shelf. Uh, so it's buy four get one. That's through next Tuesday, and uh, you can stop in if you're in the Columbus area. If you're outside of our area or the Rust Belt, as you guys are calling your territory, call us. I know we're gonna probably be um, sending that down to Florida. I would say by the end of the week for for uh, Kevin King. It sounds like, which is great. Uh, get some of that love down there. And then also, uh, Altidus USA, I'm going to light up, and I gave you guys the uh, mm-hmm. H. Upman Hispaniola. Yep. We're going to be uh, smoking that in part two, and that's from Altidus USA. Thank you to Josh Bentley and Paul Waller for all of their help on on uh, sponsoring the podcast. BS Cigar Company, we've got a couple golds. Like I said, I was smoking the silver. Those are available through Tinderbox at Easton or BS Cigar Company at gmail.com, or you can reach us uh, at the, the um, Instagram account, Facebook account, anything, or through the podcast. And then also Patreon.com. You guys are awesome for supporting us. The way that we have all this, uh, as you called it, the uh, technological advancements through uh, COVID and everything like that, that is purely from the support of not only our sponsors, but also uh, the Patreon customers. So I appreciate that from everyone out there. It's Patreon.com slash Bourbon and BS Podcast if you guys want to support that. And other than that, uh, guys, I, I appreciate part one. I'm looking forward to part two. I'm looking forward to part two. Well, good. Tim, are you looking forward to part two? Not really. I, I, <laughs> don't lie. Don't it lie it depends on how many skeletons we're bringing out. Right. <laughs> that is entirely up to you. All right, guys, thank you very much. Stay tuned. We're going to take a little break. Uh, we will stay live if you're watching the YouTube video or the Facebook live or the Facebook video after the fact. Stay tuned. We might have a little bit of uh, in between behind the scenes here. So thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Happy Whiskey Wednesday. Whiskey Wednesday. Cheers. guitar music does anyone need a break yeah i can use a little (laughs) stretch you guys walk around if you guys have any questions for these guys or myself as we get into it go ahead take a break yeah um feel free to comment on the feed yeah you can't smoke in the house the lady's going to be upset if you do if you end up on the couch with the cool dog and the lady you went too far only when they're on USB. Yeah. Yeah, for those of you that have been, uh, you know, Avi was mentioning, thank you for the help on that. Uh, the one thing that we did have is I had it actually on. We had a little uh, sound quality issues, but we fixed that about 10 minutes that in. That was the so. most stressful intro to Bourbon and BS. I felt like I was in the war room. Why is that? Because, like, you guys are going back and forth with your shit, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, can they hear me? Like, what the show? Just, just keep talking. talking. Like, should I you always just keep going just as keep if there's going. no issues. Yeah, absolutely. I was listening to... Uh, I the most like, recent Joe Rogan uh, I felt like podcast. I don't know if you guys listen to Joe Rogan, but it was um, it was interesting. He was maybe 15 minutes in or whatever, and they heard like a pop. And I think they, and of course, they joked about it because they were talking about guns and all this stuff. And they're like, man, the government, man, they're shutting us down, you know. And <laughs> then you hear the guy in the background, the producer guy, he's like, well, so I have my one Mac going. And, Does but, he do uh, his live? No, I don't believe so. So that that's like the interesting thing. Like, so I was listening to the audio. I don't really watch In the today's day and age with everything going on, like especially like I, I – YouTube is like one of my biggest consumptions of media these mm-hmm. days. Like, like just 
channels I subscribe to and stuff like that. And like, it's so, it, it's interesting. Like when you say that pop, like how many times I've heard them be like, yeah. oh yeah, we heard this pop. Like, you know, and there's like a screen that comes up because it's all pre-done and they have an editor for visual and audio yeah. and all that. And they're like, yeah, there was this pop and uh, there's going to be no audio for the rest of the episode. So we, or, or, you know, it might even be a component where like, say if they're playing a video game or watch something on TV, um, they're like, yeah, the, uh, the audio from the game crapped out. So we just replaced it with some royalty free, free, uh, smooth jazz for the rest of the thing. Hope you don't mind. Like <laughs> I just, yeah, it's interesting doing it live. And it's, it's funny because, uh, not as much anymore, but we get people that will, and guys, this is, if you're tuning in now, this is kind of between the episodes right now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's people will comment. And I appreciate the help because as we're doing this yeah. live, there's no way. And, and luckily, again, I was able to fix it because it was actually a, only a setting on yeah. this. It literally was using the internal microphone yeah. on the laptop because when we were setting it all up, I plugged it in and I never it went didn't back. Recognize it it right didn't away. recognize it. It doesn't do it automatically. And normally I'll set it up. And so that was that was definitely on me. So I'm going to take a little walk. I'll be right back. Take a walk. <laughs> Got to get my step to it, bro. Ray. We can't uh, focus every day like some people. Ray uh, Cheshire's tuning in from uh, Vietnam. No, no. Ray, welcome. If you have any questions for these guys, uh, this is something that I'll, I'll, I'll introduce. We'll get into it a little bit further, but <laughs> speaking of which, speaking of which, I am going to tell them that actually. Um, so yeah, the reason that we're doing the, uh, the chapters of life is because, um, you know, I'm talking to Ryan, I've never met Tim before. And, uh, it, it's something that, uh, he is a retired, marine and and uh and then he has another chapter and then now another chapter and it's one of those things that you know uh we we talk about it a lot on here and most of the time we have people on here that that honestly are in their 30s 40s 50s and and so everyone goes through that those different periods so having someone with a lot of different experiences not only just because tim you know being older age it's just the fact that there's so much crammed in there um and i feel like that's something that we can dive into a little bit more we were just talking about it and, and ryan told me not to tell you but i got ray cheshire who uh he he lives in vietnam now um so <laughs> did you find my hand <laughs> there's a right hand over there with a gold marine corps ring on it i'd like it back <laughs> not the hand just the ring well, if you have the hand, it's on ice. <laughs> Ray, Ray's, a, Ray's a good friend of mine that actually uh, we met when he lived over here. He's actually originally from the UK, and uh, then he moved to Hong Kong. And he's in his 50s and, and retired. Um, but, uh, yeah, his, his wife is from Vietnam, and so now that's where they live. And uh, they, they spend a lot of time, I think, in Ho Chi Minh and, and things like that. So. I, I was supposed to be there this spring before yeah. the covid and it kind of canceled the tour the guys before me were the last tour before they shut it down and i guess once the state department got them back they locked them up for 14, 14 days, days yeah you know? yeah that's the way they save it ryan how much time do you need you get your you steps in your uh, Ray says, just tell me where to look, buddy. <laughs> Do you understand? I assume it's not in Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> Maybe outside the city. <laughs> well, there might not be any trees there now. <laughs> I think, yeah, things have changed in the last, uh, oh, I don't know, several decades. I'm going to cut this so I'm ready. I want you to cut that so you're ready. Thank you, Ryan. All right, so this is a good time before we get started, Ray. Uh, yeah, while you're looking for that uh, ring, <laughs> if you guys are enjoying this, tune it in now. Uh, this would be a great time for you guys to not only enjoy it, but like it, share it on Facebook. If you're watching on YouTube live, share it on there. If you guys uh, follow the Instagram page, anything else, that's how we want to grow this. And we've got a lot of great guests like Tim and Ryan that are coming up here. And I'm interested to see as we have more people in the garage, we combine it with what we were doing with uh, COVID. Uh, when it was going on is that, you know, we had a lot of the, I don't know if you saw that Tim, when, like when Alan Rubin was on, he was at home yeah. and, or at the office and we had the different screens. So we're happy that we can actually combine people in the garage, which I appreciate you guys making the drive out here 
but then also people elsewhere that aren't able to make it. I know uh, we have a, uh, a spirit rep uh, ambassador next week, along with uh, AJ Kasmerzak, who's been on before. Then we have Juan Lopez from Gurkha Cigars after that. We have, after that, it's going to be Nate, Dustin, and I doing a blind taste testing, which we've never done before. Um, i trying to remember what's after that. We have another person on after that. Oh, we have uh, Jonathan Herring coming back on with uh, Justin from Diesel Cigars. So he's the brand ambassador with Diesel. So I'm excited about that one. And we're lining up uh, Tom Lazuka coming up, hopefully, uh, late July or early August, hopefully, whether he's in the garage or... Um, when I'm going to be talking to him tomorrow night. So, man, this is a dense cigar. Very dense cigar. I got it. This, this requires the torch. Ray also says if you ever come back to Vietnam, let him know, and then you guys can look for that ring together. <laughs> but in the meantime, Ray, if you got some free weekends. Yeah, about 20 clicks northwest to Quezon. <laughs> <laughs> There yeah. might be some debt core there. You could keep that for yourself. Perfect. Anyone tuning in right now, what are they talking about? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ryan, would you like some four roses or you want some more of this? Either either or whatever. I don't know if you because I know you were trying to pair the No, I'll put them both up here and then you can figure it out. All right, that's everybody closer. else should get a chance to try. Yeah, mm -hmm. Sean, you're good right now. All right. All right. While you light up, you pour. I'm going to get started here. <laughs> Welcome back to the Bourbon and BS podcast. This is episode 124, part two. This is the chapters of life. Take the what was that, Nate? Take Oh, no, that's the fact. Angle my mic differently. Uh, I am Steve Grant. I'm joined by Tim Kolich. Kolich? Close enough. <laughs> Tim, Kolich. close enough. Uh, no, Tim Kolich. Uh, he is from the Pittsburgh area, and uh, he owns uh, Dirty Dog Cigars. And I have Ryan Ponis also joining us, still in the garage. We are. I'm still finishing up. They, you guys already lit up the second one. I'm still enjoying the Alec Bradley Corinthian Leather. If you guys weren't listening to the beginning of the video or if you just tuned in, on audio and you're listening to part two part one we highlighted this project that uh ryan ponest had a, a his hands all over this one this is his blend his project this is the first one he's had his hands on as far as uh putting something out in the market and uh so listen to part one for our review on that also we were sipping on wiggle rye rebellion small batch which unfortunately i don't think you can get on the shelves right now but second time we've done a wiggle product from uh, pennsylvania Again, both these guys are based out of the, uh, that area. And uh, listen to that review of that one. I will say I'll give a little bit of a, a hint that we uh, reviewed it a little kinder than the uh, first product that we had, uh, Josh Bentley, that brought that Wiggles, uh, Pennsylvania straight bourbon. So uh, I, I'm still – I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, patreon.com uh, slash bourbon BS podcast. That's you guys out there that are supporting the podcast uh, with a monthly, whether it's a dollar – $5, $10, whatever you guys, $20. I know we have a few people out there doing that. It, it really helps out us doing this. This is episode, like I said, 124. I was talking to someone uh, last night, actually, that uh, was our... We, we get thousands every week through sharing and everything as far as views on Facebook, which I really appreciate it. YouTube is something that we had started more recently. And this person I was talking to, he's he, he knew the podcast. He's like, oh, you're on YouTube? And he was our 100th subscriber. Oh, no shit. Which I'm looking at, I'm like, that's only 100. It's not a big deal. He's like, dude, this is awesome. And he he follows a lot of podcasts and all that stuff. 100%. And uh, he mentioned like the Joe Rogan podcast. He's like, he's on like episode like 1400. Like, right. He's like, dude, it's have you ever listened to the old ones? And Jonathan Herring was telling me that from General Cigars last week. And I went back and listened to uh, some of those early Joe Rogan podcasts. They are not what you hear today. And well, I think that's a lot of the podcasts anymore. You know, and, it's and, like, and honestly, like Bill Burr jokes about he was like one of the first guys to do that. And like everybody else, like everybody goes, Oh, the Joe Rogan podcast. And like Bill Burr was like the first comedian to like really do that stuff. Yeah. And he's like, Oh yeah, it's real cool. Like I, I went on this medium and everybody's just blazed past me. Like, that's awesome. Like, you know, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's all cool to see, and, you know, 
which so if you guys want to support it, patreon.com slash bourbon BS podcast, or if you just like, subscribe, share it on any of the, the social media, uh, including the, the podcast listeners, even like uh, Sean, who's been on the podcast before, he brought up a uh, luminary is what his wife listens to podcasts on. And, and, and that's another one that it goes to that I didn't even know it went to. So there you go. It's out there. I also want to thank Tinderbox at Easton uh, here in Columbus, Ohio. There is a special going on at Tinderbox at Easton for the Corinthian leather. Comes in a five pack or individually, but in the five pack now through next Tuesday, you're going to be able to get buy four, get one of the Corinthian leather while supplies last. Once they're gone, they're gone. And we have 20 to 30, I think, uh, you know, five packs. So if you're in the area, you want to try one, you can do that. And it's a uh, nine ninety five on our shelf. I know when I was there, you guys kicked one of the boats while so, I was there. Cause so now you, we're down. You'd put out the. Yeah whiskey wednesday tasty tuesday thing. Yeah. so there were some guys that came and asked about it that- yeah so we're, we're, we're flying through them they're great cigars again listen to part one uh also altitus usa josh bentley and paul waller thank you very much for all the support and altitus usa h upman uh which is what we're smoking right now the hispaniola for part two as well as monte cristo romeo julieta and countless others that they have in their portfolio that are fantastic cigars we appreciate the support check them out as well and then uh, be a cigar company again i got some golds on the table I was smoking a silver uh, earlier. We got the uh, the golds coming from the Placencia factory in Nicaragua. We have the silvers coming from the Espinosa, La Zona factory in Nicaragua. So totally different cigars, medium on the gold, uh, and then a little bit fuller and more peppery on the silver. But both are fantastic cigars. Check them out as well. If you guys get the opportunity, you can always work through the podcast, and I'll help you out, point you in the right direction on that as well. So with this, this part two, this is where we kind of change – gears a little bit tim i know uh, ryan's been a part of the podcast we kind of gave you a crash course on this but we switched gears a little bit and this is uh, chapters of life uh again we we aren't always uh fortunate on our podcast to have someone with with uh the life experience that you have and and, and uh, that's why i'm happy to have you here happy to have ryan on here as well it's almost like every time i've talked about how you know life changes things you're going through relationships jobs everything else it's decades are one thing you know what i mean like age you know 10 to 20 20 to 30 30 to 40 and so on there are huge changes but i always dial it down to like almost like a five-year period it doesn't seem like much so like right now i'm 39 years old about to turn 40 and you think that 40 year old mark and and i always think about it I'm like all right so that's midlife crisis you know i remember going to like you know my parents and parents friends birthday parties back uh, when they were all turning 40 and it was like, that was the over the hill thing. You know, it was like, you had like the, the tombstones, you had the, you know, the, the, the old women or men, you know, with like canes, you know, it's like these like bust your balls type 40 year old birthday parties. I may get that, but I, I haven't seen that in the last 10 years. It, you got to understand. I grew up in the era. You got to remember I graduated high school in 1965. Okay. And the back. phrase then was don't trust anybody over 30. <laughs> you know? I think we should have stuck with that. <laughs> now it's don't trust anyone under 30, actually, in my opinion. But yeah. <laughs> but no, I think the five year mark, I think about in my life what has changed in the last five years. And I think about what's changed in the last 10 years. And it's it's dramatic. I mean, there's been some big changes in career. There's been huge changes in, in my relationships changes in my my family you know um we talked about last week being father's day you know my my father passed away and and that was three years ago so it's just like as every year stacks up and every five years there's so much that changes and then having ryan on the podcast and he wanted to bring you along and explain why and and i'm thrilled to have you not only are you in the cigar industry and being a cigar enthusiast and own a shop so you have that tie-in obviously but then you know hearing he's like oh yeah he's he's a retired marine you know like which yeah. i learned a, a while back that you're never a former marine Correct. no I, yeah. I i come from an all marine family we've got really? several generations of us and actually the the whole family's got a pretty heavy military history going back to world war ii okay um <clears throat> the changes i i it's something that you never get away from. Like, and you see it not only in the Marines, you see it in Army Airborne, mm-hmm. you know, you see it in the the Rangers, <clears throat> the the Air Force, uh, Special Forces people, like their pararescue and everything. You never quite leave that. But what you bring out of it is uh, 
you bring an attitude that it doesn't matter what somebody throws up in front of you. If you take a, you know, you may have to fall back a few yards, stop, take a deep breath, but usually you can find another way to overcome whatever that change or that problem was. Now you learned that from that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it taught me that, you know, it, it's not the mile that counts. It's just the next step, you know? And, and as I get older There's now, not too much, <laughs> not too much gets me too upset anymore. you seem really laid back have you always <laughs> been this laid back no <laughs> <laughs> which i appreciate the honesty i have some some friends that are uh you know uh they they serve in the marines and and they are some of the uh actually surprisingly again laid back i think there's a stereotype sometimes with with military you know people that have served that they are very very um High rigid rigid yes rigid yeah. uh you know it's like if you walked into my house i feel like you'd like somehow like if you walked by my bedroom you're like i don't know why his bed's not made like i feel like that because you know my my, my grandfather was in the the army when they were switching over from yeah. the army to the air force as mm -hmm. you mentioned right um and my grandmother lived with us for a while and it that's who taught me how to make my bed and I know that she'd be very upset with me now if she was with us still and saw my bed a lot of mornings, especially um, when I was single. My DI would kill me if he saw the way I live right now. <laughs> he'd kill me. I, I'm, I'm, I'll guarantee it. He'd kill me the way I live now. There's a there's something about I read something a long time ago that the average person only makes three or four life changing decisions in their whole life seems low and and it but, and, but if you really think about it marriage your first house kids you know and then maybe a career change or two in there yeah but in in general life really doesn't throw much at you that you can't overcome at least in your own head yeah i mean i i mean i've known people that have been diagnosed with terminal diseases yeah. And you would have never thought that anything, my, my second wife passed from cancer. Mm -hmm. And when they told her she had a late stage four cancer that was terminal, she looked at the doctor and she says, I don't have time for this fucking shit. Sounds like my kind of lady. You know, <laughs> she says, I have a son that I want to see graduate high school. When he graduated high school, mind you, she should have only lived a few months. Really? When he graduated high school a couple of years later, she says, I still don't have time for it. He's got to graduate college. You know, I, I and there there's. It, was I, she I, around for that? I, she didn't quite make it. OK, <clears throat> she didn't quite make it for that. Uh, I think she'd be pretty proud. He's my business partner now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she would okay. be. Um, I, I'm responsible probably for one of the most demented senses of humor that's crawling the earth right now. You know, I created it <laughs> sometimes, sometimes to my detriment, you know, but I, I think life, most people look at things right now. Yeah. And really now more than ever. Yeah. And looking at what's just, right in front of your face unless it's some tactical situation yeah 90 percent of the time you can step back and look at it and say okay i, I can't do it that way C can your pride maybe back up a little bit look yeah. at it again look at it again and then and then you know attack a second time you know and it it doesn't matter even your jobs i i think how many people do we know they complain about their job over and over and over again. I spent 26 years working in various correctional institutions. Okay. And this was after the Marines, after the Marines. Yeah. Okay. And I would hear people complain about their job or complain about an inmate or something. And I would go, wait a minute, you're going home. You got an attractive wife. You got two kids that love you and you're eating a steak. Why are you letting him upset you? That's only going to make your day worse. Then you're going to take it home. Yeah. And you can't do that. You know, one of the I, I was coming home from work. I had to work in Harrisburg. She had to stay in, in Pittsburgh because of the cancer treatments. And I guess I came home one Friday with a little bit. I had a jail voice on, you know, the, the Marine <laughs> jail voice. You brought your work home. Yeah. And I brought my work mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And she goes, just a minute. 
She goes, rustles around in the bedroom. She comes out wearing something very attractive that I had bought her. She had a cigar and a glass of, Man, of great, of, great lady. The, yeah. <laughs> she had the last of almost the last of my bottle of Oban 50 year old. I was like, this was treat time. All right. And she looked at me and she says, honey, did you miss me? Yeah. Mm hmm. She said, do you like what you see here? And I said, yes. She wow. said, do you like what's on the tray? I said, yes. And she says, good, because if you don't get rid of that damn da jail voice, you're not going to get anything behind the tray tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Both literally and metaphorically. Yeah, that yeah, tray. yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was a <laughs> I was on the porch with that glass of scotch and that cigar in a split second. 45 minutes later, I came in the house and everything was copacetic. <laughs> we learn, you know what I mean? You, you have to learn to, your problem is not everybody else's problem. Uh, you, a good friend will help you through the problem. But basically, you know, it's on you. you, you you've got to get that head right. Um, when I first lost my hand, Somebody in the Navy, I spent about seven months in the Navy hospital, getting put back together, so, getting an arm built. So speaking of that, wh yeah. when did that happen? This happened in 1967. 1967. And I got, I got the arm in six, spring of 68. Okay. And, and okay. can you mind sharing, you, you were overseas? I, I was overseas. It, it's not a war story. Okay. It, uh, I don't have a purple heart or anything like that. We, we had some equipment. We were in Indian country. Okay. You know, there were bad, bad guys around. And um, we had no contact with the enemy, but I can't get into it a lot. We had a bird that needed to be blown. Okay. And we had a premature detonation on one of the smaller charges. I might have made the mistake. The other guy might have made the mistake. We don't know. Bad day in Black Rock. 45 <laughs> minutes later, I'm in a field hospital. You know, we were, bird was, there was another bird to take me out real quick, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it was for me, it's like I said, no great, no, no great story. I, I flew. How um, old were you then? 19 when it happened. Well, 20 when it happened. Wow. I turned, I turned 21 in the Navy hospital. Um, Happy birthday. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> a little different than a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of yeah, a little but, different than a lot of birthdays. But following that, when it was in the hospital, somebody told me I may as well sell my parachute and a motorcycle because I'd never use them again. And I'm wow. like wait a minute. I'm the only guy on the block that's going to have one of these. I had a desire to get an education. So I says, okay, I got GI bill and get a college. I can get a degree. You know, I can do something with my life from this point on. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm going, wow, if I can tell a good story, maybe learn to cook, ride a motorcycle and skydive with one arm, Man, I'm gonna meet a lot of young ladies, <laughs> and, and I just kind of like motivation is killer. <laughs> the mo motivation, that's, it. it's all it is. It's yeah, that step back and uh, most of my jobs, I had a problem getting the job because of having one arm. Like what kind of jobs though? I mean, uh, you trying to... I, I mean, I played the business world for a little while okay. after I got my degrees. I, it was boring. I, I just. I worked for a couple of management consulting firms. I worked for Westinghouse Nuclear Energy Systems for a while. Um, and I just, I couldn't, people were complaining about the dumbest stuff. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You were in 20s at this point, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's like, wait a minute, you're complaining. It takes me five minutes to tie my shoes with a hook, <laughs> you know, and you're complaining about stupid stuff, you know. Um, it was just that that idea of the, the people that I was meeting in the business world were not considering what was really going on in their life. You know, you complain about work and you're missing your wife telling you something really important. And we all know when we've come home and you say something to your wife and she goes, whatever, or <clears throat> yeah. all right, do what you want. Don't do it. You know you're in trouble. Just stop and think for a few minutes. You but know. she said it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't work. It doesn't work. It never works. No. No. Yeah, it's Jedi mind. No, it's very blatant. Yeah, you know, I understand. I feel like, though, at that age, you know, being in your 20s and, and having that experience, obviously, I think that just fast forwards you. You know what I mean? If you have, if you have that right mentality, 
Mm-hmm. I, I'm shocked to hear it in a sense because, you know, it's it's not it's not difficult to be like, oh man, what if that happened to me when I was 20 years old? Absolutely. No, I'd I'd be crushed. Obviously, you weren't happy about it, right? You know what no. I mean? And, and you were serving, you were doing all this stuff, yeah. and not only did that part change, but now you have all right. So, how many more years I have on this earth? It's I have one arm. I mean, this that wasn't change, part of the playbook, right? It can change in a heartbeat. Absolutely. You know, but so to have that mentality that you're talking about is 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 huge because it does. Once you you do what you're talking about and you, you kind of change the frame of mind there, mm-hmm. you know, and put everything in perspective for yourself. Yeah. Which is there's tough. A, there's a picture on the internet right now of a young veteran. Uh he was one of these somebody took him on a hunting trip out west. Yeah. And he had to make a long shot. He sat on, turned the artificial leg so the foot was sticking up mm-hmm. and used it as a rifle, used it as a rifle rest. You know, I, I looked at that picture and I went, God love you, man. You know, it's <laughs> you, you do with what you got to do. Mm-hmm. I if I don't if I don't have my favorite cigar, I'm happy with a three dollar shop cigar. You're happy with a Corinthian leather from Alec Bradley. <laughs> Yeah, but I have to deal with Ryan a lot. <laughs> you got to remember, he worked for me. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, he didn't You're really work for, for me. He he worked for me, and he got paid in free cigars and Chinese food. And yeah, a lot of good liquor. <laughs> it's a fair trade. It is honestly it is. a lot of that money would have gone to that anyways, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what a you know, I've I've had the the pleasure and privilege of of knowing Tim and and getting to work for him and knowing right. him as a friend. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I turned 34 this year. Tim turned 74, correct? 73. 73. Don't rush it. So don't rush it. Um, <laughs> I don't know too many people that would say that they have a 73 year old friend when they're 34, but like the, the stuff that I've heard Tim talk about over the years, it, it's fascinating to me because, because I think it has a lot to do with the tenacity of like the human spirit. And sure one of the things that I've found most interesting is his coping ability with a lot of things. And I remember at one point he had told me about when he had lost his arm, it was a bad situation. And in like some sort of, I guess you could say irony learning on what to do with his prosthetic was something that like gave you purpose almost or something like that. And like, it's kind of weird that the situation that you're given that's not a good situation actually yeah. is what gets you out of the situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Explain a lot of, that a little bit more, please. I'll let Tim do that. Well, besides if, meeting if, women, if, and like, if a you know, mistake, obviously. if you make a mistake and you royally screw up, there's probably only a limited thing is going to happen. You're going to continue to fail if you dwell on the fact that you screwed up. Yeah. You know, now granted some screw ups might be social and you have to make some apologies. <laughs> a few. Sometimes there's alcohol involved. Uh, sometimes there's alcohol Cheers involved. Everyone. But if you step back from a problem and look at it and say, all right, what's my next decision? Well, one might be, don't do that again. Yeah. You know, learn from your mistakes. Yeah. Right? I mean, learn from your mistakes. Right there, yeah. And I, I grew up with immigrant grandparents. Okay. So in my house, like, you know, my grandfather is be no shit, boy. I not teach you Croat or Rovatsky, the, the language, ah, you know, got it. we be Americans. Now we speak America, you know, and think about those guys. They were in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. My, my grandparents were all born in the 1880s. By 1900, not speaking English, they jumped on a boat because some guy from U.S. Steel came to the village and said, we'll take all 50 of you guys and we'll give you free fare to America if you work in steel mills. Well, so they're getting to another country. They're doing something they didn't know anything about. One grandfather was a naval officer for the Austro-Hungarian Navy. He was educated. The other one was a big farmer, coal miner kind of guy, you know, lived up in the mountains. So they get to a country, they speak no English. Within years, World War I hits the country. Right after World War I, the Spanish flu. 
they no sooner get after the Spanish flu and they're in the depression. Then they get World War II. And now they're losing sons and daughters. Mm. You know? I mean, think about complaining about what we just went through for the last six months. <laughs> it's been a compared while. to that. <laughs> I how you can't look at this like the, the COVID thing and the shutdown. You can't look at it and be depressed. You're going, holy crap, this could have been the black plague. <laughs> you know, yeah, it could no, have been right. worse. You know. So again, perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a used to ride with a another leg am, he was a leg amputee. We both we had motorcycles. Nice. And we're going down the parkway in Pittsburgh. What'd you ride? At that time it was a 750 Super Sport Honda. Yeah. I yeah. had I had to re-engineer. 70s? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. had to I had to re-engineer the throttle on the left, you know, Switched stuff the, like yeah, that. Yeah. And another one arm buddy helped me do that. And we became the first two one arm motorcycle riders in Pennsylvania. I was only number two because he was a little tougher than I was, and he he was in the line. <laughs> um but we're the, the third guy that I went to college with was a leg amputee. We're going down the parkway, and my hook disconnected. While I, riding. I, yeah, while it was riding. It kind of fell loose <laughs> like that. So I'm going down the parkway at 60 <laughs> mile an hour. With you the pull hook, over? With the hook that I can no longer control, dangling at the end of a wire. And so I figured, okay, all right, just back off the throttle. Don't get panicky. Just get the speed done. This way you'll at least... You won't break as much if you, you have a problem. If you won't speed break lower. as much. And he pulls up beside me because he could see me like I'm getting, you know, he's seeing you're the panicking. body motion. You're panicking he bit. pulls up beside me and he looks at the hook dangling and typical leg amputee who is also a skydiver. You know, he's competent. You right, know what right, I mean? Right, he's yeah. adapting. He looks at me and just yells out, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good friend right there. Yeah. You got, yeah. We guys friends after that? <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, we were. We stayed friends for quite a few years. Wait, what happened? Did you just pull over eventually? You just let us yeah, slow down? I managed to, you know, I just, a lot of cars were bitching and everything else, but we just managed to let it. I, got, I said, don't disturb it. You know, keep it straight. Where was, just, the, where was the clutch on that? I got to clutch, so clutch, clutch is over here. Clutch throttle's there too. My throttle worked forward. Okay, so you, it's you pull it in. Yours. So I would I would accelerate by squeezing the clutch in and going like that. I bring the, the throttle up. Right. I couldn't do a wheelie. I found that out the hard way. Don't try that. <laughs> that was a little bit of road rash. But there I learned too. I made a mistake. The decision was don't do that again. Nothing was on the right hand side. Nothing. No nothing break, other right? than Just other than the grip. front brake. Yeah. Oh, and you I, had the front yeah, brake. I could feel the, the front brake. Okay, and you had the rear brake shifting. Yeah. normal. Okay. I'm yeah. just trying to wrap my head around this. <laughs> I was worried when my my spark plug would foul. And I, couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a '75 RD350 Yamaha, right? And it was like it was, it bought for 200 bucks, never ran yeah. right the whole time I owned it, right? And it was like I'd come up to a stoplight and it would like the plug would foul. I'm like, well, I got one plug. Yeah, I carried him with me. I had to pull yeah. over and switch it. But when I fouled out the one, I'm like, I had to head home. So hearing that story, I'm like, yeah, it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> you know? It's all about perspective. Um. I want to show that while we're talking about this, because and this is again, bear with us. If you guys are watching on the video, uh, if you listen to the audio, you, you can't really see this a whole lot. But uh, you so can see uh, through listening, you can just close your eyes when you're listening. You can see it. Um, you have a, a, an arm now that's a robotic arm, not that's, this one that you have on. Right, I, I do have a, a robotic arm that's nerve operated. You know, I, yeah. I fire signals. In fact, the, the company that makes the arm is right here in Columbus. Yeah, that's what Ryan was saying. Yeah. And it's uh, being being fine-tuned right now, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, it, it, it went schizophrenic on me in November, <laughs> and we decided we were going to rebuild it and change the technology a bit, and then yeah. COVID hit, and, you know, I couldn't get to the arm shop, wasn't taking people, the VA wasn't, you know. And it, the, the arm's a $100,000 expense, you know, so the... Well, 80 to 120, depending on what kind of bells and whistles you put on it. So I want to show this uh, because I think this is this is relative. And bear, bear with me here because uh, I'm trying to run this here. Um, so it, it 
the most important thing that you were all really concerned with, right? Could I flip a finger? All right. So <laughs> if you guys are watching this, this is uh, this is Tim. Uh, priorities first. After how many years with with what you had, like the the form you have on? I've had this arm approximately fifty years. Fifty and, years. And this that picture was <laughs> taken about uh, about a year ago. So much like any other 70 year old child that gets a hundred thousand dollar toy, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is what you're you're concerned with. And this is the technology. Hundred thousand dollars, not including the R and D that went into right. this, but the actual product is uh making sure that he can flip the bird. So I don't know if you guys are what you're all looking down at your phones for the delay here. Um so this is obviously uh priority one with 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 Tim with this this Basically, he's got a house on his arm. You know what I mean? Not anymore, but... I think it was actually five Chrysler Cordobas. <laughs> <laughs> this also... Fully equipped with Corinthian leather. This also leather. doesn't have Corinthian leather. <laughs> well, it is. It's just the black Corinthian leather black. made... You know, it's imitation vinyl. So, so <laughs> I well, while we have this up, so I don't have to keep trying this, but uh, for, for to walk through, this is kind of something that, again, now that you own a, a shop and you're you're obviously a cigar enthusiast, this is the and, and I, I'm I'm curious how much this blew your mind after 50 years or whatever with, with I the, the, the I had book. had the arm uh, the the myoelectric that's the actual term for it I had had the myoelectric arm for about a year and it it took quite a few months to get the <laughs> to learn to do muscle isolation, nerve okay. isolation, stuff like that. But what we're going to see here in a minute is what made me feel the best about having that hand. Now I can do more rough stuff with this oh, carpentry, you're used to it. everything yeah, right? else. Yeah. yeah. And it's more durable, more or less ride a but, motorcycle. Yeah. But and this <laughs> took me to what we're going to see took me to feeling better. Yeah. So this is you, and this is uh, uh, taking a cigar out of a wrapper. Yeah. From, from so someone, you know, you buy a cigar or whatever. You own a shop. You grab a cigar. And for those of you guys watching, walk walk us through this a little bit. Well, there I'm taking the, the foot band off of it, and you can see the dexterity. I can I can grab the band to hold it and cut it like a real. You know, like I did when I had two hands. Yeah. That this is me, after 50 years. Yeah, that was, that afternoon was just like, oh, crap. <laughs> right. You don't really have to worry about burning anything. I haven't anymore. gotten burned at a barbecue in years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's that, amazing. That's absolutely that can, amazing. You, you actually, we even, yeah, that was the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back and down, I've, so. I've had it on a rifle and pistol range. I've been good enough with it. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. What what did you do after uh, you, you said you did the management stuff? And this is kind of where I'm, you know, you, you we fast forward there, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we fast forward from from being in Vietnam and then coming back and, you know, doing the education thing and doing the management thing. And obviously you were you were concerned with with, uh, you know, if I can do all this stuff, I can meet a girl and all this stuff, yeah. you know, like priorities for a 20 yeah. some year old. Yeah. Um, but you, you also just skimmed over other, what I would consider again, given the topic, you know, the, the chapters you were in the correctional system I got, for I a got, while. Yeah. I got tired of on the uh, good side of the correctional. Yeah. <laughs> on, I'm, yeah. I was on the outside. Yeah. We got yeah. yeah. to don't let people yeah. run with the words. Here. And yeah. <laughs> a, a buddy of mine, um, at the time had been working we i'd been doing some volunteer work with uh at a uh street level drug clinic with at-risk juveniles and they just kind of recruited me because i had referred several kids there yeah. with not professionally just hey man come here I, you got to talk to somebody you got a problem let me you know and he he approached me he says tim he says how'd you like to work at the clinic and i says oh, i have a job i'm working with westinghouse and he goes yeah he says uh you might want to keep that we're not going to pay you <laughs> <laughs> and i i said uh, you know and he got me doing the volunteer work and then 
after a couple of years or so, I got tired of the, uh, the management stuff. Yeah, the business. Plan, and right? and I just and then Three Mile Island happened, and of course there was not a, a lot of commercial nuclear power after that. Mm-hmm. So I'm unemployed for a little while, and he asked me if I would want to interview for a county juvenile detention center. Now this was in 1980, when um, Pittsburgh was in the throes of some serious gang wars. We had about 13 subsets of gangs in the city. Only 12 cell blocks on that juvenile correction facility. So you can see the problem. We can never separate them. He says they need, they want somebody with an education that can work with the kids. And by the way, you got to be able to fight and you can't hurt anybody, you know? So, um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's tough. I, yeah, that was Almost a detriment. Kind of, that's but, a hell of you know. a selling pitch, by the <laughs> yeah, way, for that yeah, job. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I ended up going there. And of course, the Connie wasn't at first, you know, the, the Connie doctors weren't going to approve me and everything. And finally, I says, look, buddy, I'm jumping out of airplanes. I'm riding motorcycles. I backpack. Uh, my brother had a sailboat at the time. I raced sailboats with him. You know, I says, what isn't there, you know, and I was in martial arts at the time. That's before I was old and fat. And he says, I I says, I can do this. So they gave me a shot at it. The first day on the job, there was a large disturbance in one of the aggressive cell blocks. Mm -hmm. The supervisor who I was OJTing under at the time says, come on, we got to go. I says, what do we do? He says, get in there. And he says, if they're, if they try to hurt you, take them to the ground, try not to hurt them. We walked in, six kids charged me. I swung the hook in a big circle, and they all ran for their cells. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Did you? You didn't connect. No, I didn't. I I didn't want to connect. No, I know that. But they all ran for the cells, and the supervisor looked at me and he says, "Now I know what kind of block you're going to be working on." (laughs) And and I spent the next ten years working in a facility where I was. You know, one of the small group of guys that if they knew there was going to be trouble, hey, Tim, you're you're working K today, you're working G, you know, whatever the block was. And I stayed with it for 10 years. Yeah. Um, after about 10 years, remember I said those life changing decisions? Yeah. I got to the point that I says, you know what, this is this is getting rough. This is too much of this. Too much. Were of you uh, were you married to your your second I was wife? My that? First, that was your first, first wife, wife okay. at the time. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I, well, by this time, at the end of the ten years, we were we had gotten a divorce. It was amicable, you know. Um, but I walked away from the job, and I I says I I got to I got to get out of this for a little bit. You know, this is this getting it's affecting. Remember what I was saying about keeping your head right. If yeah. you can't keep your head right, you need to look at why you can't keep your head right. Yeah, you have to you so have I a little up. self-reflection, right? Yeah, and yeah. I went I went back into the business world. That lasted about four years. And then eventually I applied. I didn't, again, I didn't like the business world. And eventually I says, okay, my head's not right. Step back. Mm-hmm. And I took a job with the state of Pennsylvania Department of Corrections. By this time, with my degrees and everything, at least this time, I wasn't wearing any kind of a uniform or in a security situation. I was doing um, diagnostic counseling, meaning I I was determining what a new inmate, what his life in the prison would be like. You know, could he be a minimum security, medium, max or super max? You know, I I made those during the sentence or like from jail to prison. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is they. It was like a classification center. What are your you degrees know? in? I got a degree in economics, and then I did a bunch of work in uh, social work. Obviously, yeah. I had to pick that up on the side. Um, I, basically, I I kind of managed to keep the job because I was a jack of all trades and a master of none. You know, but I had that <laughs> diversity. Did everything to be able yeah. to do it. You know, and then I spent almost fifteen years there. During that period of time, I met my second wife and uh, got my stepson off the shelf. It was really cool. He was beyond <laughs> diapers, you know. Off the shelf. <laughs> got the advanced model. Yeah, I got yeah. the advanced nice. model. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I should give a shout out. His name is Sean, and the other business tar- partner is Greg. 
So That's I've got dogs, right? I've got two dirty I've got two middle aged, you know, mid thirty year olds to work for me. So life is a hassle. I'm the old man, you know. <laughs> They're kicking and dragging me, you know, dragging me and kicking me into the uh high tech world. You're you just know. letting it happen at this point, aren't you? Yeah. 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 yeah it's easier, so I think. It, it's back to that thing, you know. I, I've never been happier in my life since I opened the cigar shop 11 years ago. Wow. It took me a year by myself to build the humidor. The humidor's about 10 by 30. Yeah. About 10 by 30 feet, I guess. Uh, It took me months, you know, to build a wall. It would take somebody else a day. You know, it took me months to build it. If I ran into a problem, YouTube YouTube was a wonderful thing, you know. Were you uh, financially kind of okay at that point retired yeah okay. uh, because obviously that time you know i got and, and, i got retirement from the state okay. got social security and of course i get the money from disability military disability yeah right you know okay good um uh, during that by this time the motorcycles were gone the the parachute was gone you know i learned that early on skydiving was done skydiving was gone. Yeah, don't yeah. don't take away the parachute yeah I, <laughs> <laughs> you can't <laughs> <laughs> the parachute stayed packed and, and yeah. on the shelf. Right. I mean, right. I did that long enough just to prove I had problems d- jumping. You know, I, I broke my leg one time. I had a malfunction where my hook, I had a bad opening. I, instead of opening, you know, face to earth yeah. in a nice stable position, just as I pulled, I flipped. And when my shrouds come off my back, they tangled the hook. And had me hanging in the hook. <laughs> had me hanging by the hook in the shroud. <laughs> so I get it on. I, I get like them. That. I That's get in them. the manual. Don't yeah. put any sharp objects <laughs> yeah. near the parachute. And so you're I, looking at that. You're like, I don't know so, what you mean. Yeah, there's always. So I, I, I get the hook untangled, but unfortunately, I swung the wrong way in the shrouds. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we're not jumping with old modified military shoots in those days. We didn't have the big wings that they have mm-hmm. now. The para commander shoots, which were high tech, were just too expensive for my pocketbook then. So I'm now facing backwards in the shoot, opposite of the way it should be going. You know. Yeah, I feel like you never want uh, that ground to be a surprise. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you want to be looking at yeah. it. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> so it was. It was kind of. It was kind. I didn't do it. I didn't do it that many times because obviously I was short on money, and you know. 30, 40 bucks for a jump in those days in the seventies and eighties was, yeah, that was a lot of money, you know? Uh, but I got enough in to tell me, all right, you know, you, you've done what most people don't do and mm-hmm. you've done what almost nobody would do with one arm. Were these like bucket list items or are these just things you wanted to do? How do you, how do you classify that? You know what I mean? Again, looking at the, the chapters of life, I mean, you, you, you peg those when you're talking about the past in your 20s about that you know what i mean like i mean the, I, is it bucket list were, items were, or is it so you you made the comment actually about when you got the arm like they told you like traded the motorcycles and that was that was that was that a, a general statement or did you actually were you doing that stuff prior to i what i i had i had jumped in the course sport parachute i went okay. you know not so you had experience not, yeah i had yeah. some experience you know um and I'd been riding motorcycles, you know, in the core and stuff like that. You know? In your late teens and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, it was when somebody told me that it was more of a challenge. You know, you're telling me I need to get out in the world. You know, you're going to have a lot of changes, young Marine. You know, you go through that <laughs> sensing that therapy, they call it <laughs> the phys- occupational therapy. Okay. But to me, that was, that was, I don't know if it was intended or not. I think it was a bad thing to say to me. What happens when you tell a 20 year old that he, or well, by that time, 21 year old, he can't do anything, you know, you're going to do it, you know? So I did. And yeah. I, I just use that as a, that's the kind of stuff that kind of made me, that calmed me down, you know? It like, calms you down. Well, <laughs> correcting a problem in a parachute, you know, when you're still 2,500 feet off the ground, you know what I mean? And, no, I don't. And- I don't. Honestly, <laughs> no, anything that you're saying at this point, I'm just looking at it. I'm like, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it uh, because I feel like I speak for a lot of people is that in that situation, I mean, you like, 
to quote your friend when your hook came off and you, you were riding a motorcycle, you're, you're fucked. fucked. You're fucked. <laughs> like yeah. That's, you know. that's what I'm thinking. And I, I think that I'm not alone in that. And my dad was my rifle coach in my teen years and everything. You know what I mean? So the, the first thing he did was had a gunsmith build me a left-handed uh, bolt action rifle, you know, and, uh, we asked I got back to doing that. You're you're right handed before or left handed. I was right handed before, yeah. and a piano player. <laughs> hmm. Keep working on that arm, yeah. that new arm. You know, <laughs> if you can master that with that robotic arm, the, I yeah. tell you what, the hook plays a lot really of good videos chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. play good chopsticks. <laughs> I don't know. Did you have that mentality? That's I guess that's something. And obviously, no one has the same mentality typically. You know, when they're a late teenager or just teenager, right? Going in your twenties and again thirties, forties, and and so on. I mean, did you were you ingrained in that? I, I feel like that's something that we have. You brought up your dad, um, that that trained you a bit prior he, and then after. Yeah, he you know, was. The, the uh, he was a tough little guy, in a good way. Shorter. You know? Yeah, smaller than me. I'm one of the bigger members of the family. And how tall are you? you know, I'm five nine. Five, my dad was towering, a towering tower. five nine. But, yeah. yeah, but my dad was uh, in the thirties. You know, he had done uh, uh, some amateur boxing and he sparred it's some tough. extra money. You know, so he was a tough little guy, but he was an old world tailor too. You know, and really? he read everything he could read. I mean, the guy could sit there and discuss. He he had a less than high school education. But he could sit and discuss the difference between Norse and Greek mythology yeah. with you, you know. And and you know, I I was really young, and he was going, "Hey, this is a guy called Ernest Hemingway. You got to read him." Yeah, you know, and so stuff like you. that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, because again, that's not. I don't. I don't think that's necessarily a, a nature thing, or you know, that, that's more of a nurture thing. You know, this mentality well, you're talking about. I mean, it's it went out. Hmm. It, it's interesting to me that uh, okay. to bounce back because you know, yeah. Fast forward to now, and, and I think some of the people that listen to this podcast, you know, they're 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 clearly not in their seventies. They don't have the experiences. No one has the same experiences, especially to the uh, call it extremes that you you've gone through. But it's what I'm taking from this is there is that mindset. You know, a lot of people talk about ad adversity, and and it's like this huge obstacle that you know it's not just like a hurdle that you're running down like you're you know olympic runner and you just you hit those hurdles and it looks so natural you know what i mean and i think a lot of people will, will deal with that but no that that hurdle is is twice as tall as you and you still have that mentality that all right well i can't just jump over it so now i gotta figure out can i go around it can, can i go I around do, it do i can i can i set something up to can i build can i build a ladder exactly you know, stuff like that um if if you have one of these, when you first get them, obviously it takes a long time before you become comfortable enough to do finite, you know, little delicate things with it. Brush your teeth. Like one of the things I used to do was we'd go to a bar. Uh, I of course I never drank alcoholic beverages. Uh, I would just go with my friends. Yeah. I mean, you're drinking now. And man. if I didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> somebody would always bring up a question in the bar about how you do that, you know, and I'd say what I could do with it. And, and then I would make the remark that I could, if they would lay a long cigarette ash out on the bar that I could pick it up from both ends and hand it to them without breaking it. And if you with did this, that, yeah. Okay. You can't do it with your fingers. <laughs> and I would of course crush the first one. I can do this. I can do this. I bet you can't. Is there? Yeah, I was gonna say, is there a bet there? Yeah, Sorry. and then I got free beer. <laughs> Had to exit a bar a couple of times in a hurry. You know what I mean? But uh, <laughs> because you, of the hustle, or because you got drunk? A little bit of both. All right. Um, but that back to that thing. You know, uh, to me, I looked at it. Okay, I don't have a lot of money tonight. I need another beer. <laughs> <laughs> simple you know <laughs> solve the problem i admire that <laughs> i think i admire that well i think like and i don't know if we've ever talked about it on the podcast the time i've been there like 
from a young age, uh, sort of like a, a personal mantra that I always have. Yeah. You, know, you have focus. I have adversity builds character. And Correct. like, it's one of those things where I will go into a, a place and I'll have a conversation with a stranger and I'll be like, oh man, they're a hell of a guy. And then like, whenever they leave, I always have like this thought in my head. I'm like, wonder what sort of shit that they've gone through in their life to actually make them that person. You know what I mean? Cause Deep like thinker there, man, absolutely. And I, I think there's a lot of people like that. And, and the people that I think that are some of the most awesome, some of the most, you know, just salt of the earth people like that. There is a lot, you know, typically as you, you end up getting to know these people, you start to learn it and not everybody's hardship and not everybody's adversity is having your hook come off on a motorcycle or getting it tangled in a thing or having your arm blown off or anything like that. But like, at the end of the day, you know, everybody has problems that affect them in a certain way that is unique to them. Um, That's right. Well, I think a lot of times you, you, you're looking at it like from the angle of like, why was that guy an asshole? Or why was that person like, why was that woman acting that way? Like, what's what's her deal? And you always then you if you if you have your head about you, you might step back and be like, all right, no, they're, they're going through their own things. You know what I mean? They might have had a bad day. They might be going through some shit or anything like that. Or hell, maybe they haven't. Well, maybe, I think that's the other not, aspect maybe of it. They don't have the the foresight to think maybe you're going through something. Maybe you shouldn't treat somebody like that. No, I know, and I think that's it's a bit. It's very relative right now. Just like always, you know, based on all these stories, you know, based on your 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 parents and grandparents, Tim, and and even now, I mean, you know, you you brought up all that stuff, and then you compare it to you know what the the country and world went through with COVID. It's it's we're all through this together. But when there's everything just going normal. Yeah, as normal as things can go, people are still in bad moods, right? People are still going through some shit. And if you have a good, you know, smile on your face and you're trying to do all that stuff, it's almost again you take it for granted, right? You know, yeah. you, you, you take it for granted. You you take it for something that it's like, oh, everything's going well with them. But sometimes you do have to just look at it as a challenge, so that you when you leave the your house in the morning and your morning was terrible, or you get got in a fight with your spouse, or you know your 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 dog shit all over the place and you know, you're late to work. Yeah. You still show up and you, you're, you're, you gotta take care of the day. Change hats. Change hats. I like Change that. hats. It's, you know, um, it's, I've led a pretty, I, I'm, I'm very happy with, you know, the way I've lived. I've, I've tried to make amends for anybody that I, you know, I always apologize when I was a jerk, you know, but Are you always that way. Pretty much. Okay. My old man kind of taught me early on. He he says, uh, we lived in, I, I, by the time I got to high school, it was a fairly rough neighborhood. You know what I mean? So you were throwing your hands up a lot. And my old man's attitude when I'd come home, he'd look at me and he'd say, huh? He says, uh, no fight. Says, yeah, dad. He says, cops coming? Says, no. He says, who started it? He didn't care who won. You know, he yeah. started. If I had started it, my life would have been yeah. horrible. You're in trouble. If, if I said, no, nope, I didn't start it. He'd say, did you win? I says, I don't know. You know, and then he'd look at the cuts or whatever. And he'd say, he, because he used to box, he did some cut work. Every All those guys did some cut work in the corner of the ring, you know. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, well, do you want to go get stitches or you want me to fix it? I always let him fix it. Yeah, <laughs> he made it more painful, and I always remember, "Don't make that mistake again." You know, <laughs> and to this day, Wait, make the mistake of <laughs> yeah. letting him fix it, or making the mistake of being in a fight. Make a mistake of being in a fight. There it is. You know, don't yeah. get in it unless. And in all the all the stuff I did, I've never been in a bar fight because I always had enough sense to know, you know, that's the kind of mistake that can ruin a life for you. Yeah. You know, there's nothing in that bar that that person is going to say to you that's worth going to jail. So I'd always be the one, throw the bartender what I owed plus a little more and said, see you tomorrow night, Sam, you know, and be gone. And there's so many people, they hit adversities like that. And right away, they, they run right up against it like an, they're hitting a brick wall. Yeah. You know, you, you get nowhere when you do that. There's no rational thought there. Yeah. Yeah. You said something we, we talk about on the podcast a lot, and it was interesting when you were talking about the perspective, right? 
And uh, one of the sayings we have on this podcast is when you're, you're, you're in the middle of something, a lot of the times you are so focused on that, that, that aspect or whatever the, the issue is, whether it be your job you were talking about mm -hmm. or uh, your relationship or, or obviously other adversities is that you let it consume you. And I always talk about it with this, this hand in your face thing, mm -hmm. right? So when, when the issue is right here, you can't focus just visually, right? You can't focus on the hand. You can't look beyond it. It's just all blurry. Yeah. But there's, there's this point where if you, based on what you're saying, you, 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 you put effort behind moving that issue away. Now everything, you can see the hand, no problem. And if you need to look beyond it, you can you can refocus really quickly. Exactly. And you move that away from you so it doesn't consume you. And and having you on here is it's I love that because it it puts a a reality, a person, a personality behind it more than just me and my again 30s talking about that. Yeah. You know, based on my limited experience. And and it's not that it's not valid, but it's something that I had to work on in my thirties. And it sounds like, you know, your, your father actually kind of, uh, instilled that up upon you yeah. early he and did. that's, yeah. And that's where shit. I mean, again, at, at 20, 21 years old, you, you know, coming back from overseas and, and losing an arm and, yeah. and, you know, this service that you were going to do, like your, your whole life is the whole life turned changed. upside down. My mother got most upset when she saw me pick up a suitcase with the hook. And, and you mentioned brushing your teeth. Yeah. My mother's concern at that time was, how are you going to hold a toothbrush to brush your teeth? What would you say? <laughs> well. <laughs> if you do it with a hook, you just say your left hand. No, I actually have a hole go straight through this arm up here from okay. a previous operation. And I did what I shouldn't have done to your your blessed mother. I put the toothbrush in the hole and took the, the <laughs> toothpaste to put it on the thing and pulled it back out and started brushing my teeth. Um. <laughs> you answered the question. That's all that's important, right? Yeah, I answered the question. And for about three days, my mother didn't talk to me. <laughs> Have you used the uh, robotic arm to brush your teeth? Pardon? Uh, you... Yeah. 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 Uh, now I, you know, I can do things that that finer things. It's kind of nice to be able to hold a bottle, you know, and turn the cap on it. Where this thing doesn't. I, this has a lot of snap to it. So holding yeah, like could... a <laughs> holding a soft water bottle is. That it takes me 60, 70 pounds of pressure to hold this. I'm doing it with his shoulder. It takes about 60 or 70 pounds for me to hold that in position. What's shocking to me with this, that that's just a really, really strong rubber band. They're just a stack of rubber magic. bands. <laughs> and when I did my other job, my old jobs, that stack was like this thick. So now I understand why it's so so expensive for the robotic one. <laughs> Cuz the old technology was it, was so hooks like, and rubber bands. That, this this hasn't changed in 100 years. That's amazing. The most amazing might thing about it is I mean that that's a bicycle cable. That essentially operates that. <laughs> what was that, Ryan? That's a bicycle cable that essentially operates no, it, that. It's an aviation grade, 64, oh, it's aviation 64 grade, strand but... aviation grade cable. So on the side of this, there, <laughs> you guys can't see this, and and for the, even the audience probably haven't read this. He says you should probably read this, and and on this is this carbon fiber? Uh, carbon fiber and Kevlar, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, little level level of defense there too. <laughs> yeah. So it says on there, uh, Surgeon General's warning, which is very relevant to the cigar world, um, use of explosives during time of time of war is hazardous to your health. <laughs> <laughs> now the new <laughs> if if. This is the best thing I've heard in a long time. If the replacement arm comes through the way they want it to be, this whole section is going to look like it's made out of oak, like a baseball bat. <laughs> That's a warning label that makes sense. So he was at a bar one time, <laughs> and this woman and her husband, this uh, woman and her husband come up and sit at the bar next to him. The woman sat between the husband and Tim. And the woman happened to look over, and she saw Tim's arm, and she just immediately goes, Oh, I already see you two are going to be best friends. And like literally just like walked away from the conversation. Why? 
the whole string of guys from there, Don. We're all retired EOD guys, like FBI, <laughs> FBI, state police, county, <laughs> Pittsburgh SWAT. And these were old heads like me, you know. These guys had been retired for a while. Yeah. I had to get an Uber home that night. <laughs> <laughs> no bar tricks are going to get you mm -hmm. home that night. Mm -mm. You're going to keep in that bar. Yeah, how many bar tabs have you had bought for you over the years? Ball you know, it em embarrasses me because I really don't like people to do. I'm that not saying you're asking for it, but I mean, yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's a, a, a lot comment of on. Yeah. Uh, you know, Actually, it's human good, nature, right? Because a lot of people, um, obviously, other servicemen. When you run into other handicapped mm -hmm. servicemen, anybody that's if you've been in the crap, it doesn't matter whether you've been in it 13 seconds or 13 months. Once you're in the crap, everybody's brothers. Yeah, you know. So I've had a lot of, of course, at the same time, I'm doing the same for them, you know. Right, right. Yeah, but I, you'd be surprised tax. how many people come up and have, have tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, my son served. I'm glad he came back. OK, you yeah. know, let me buy you a drink. You know, I appreciate it, but it's a little. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes I feel like I get put on a spot, so. And I, I understand people want to be, people want to be nice. And yeah, we've I don't talked think about it. A, you know, go ahead, Ryan. I was going to say, and we've talked about that before, like whether, whether you experience it or a lot of your brothers and friends experience coming back from Vietnam, it wasn't like that. Oh, yeah. uh, coming back Vietnam was. So to see like, cause we had this conversation once about okay. the whole thank you for your service thing, like how that became a big thing, like for, for, our generation yeah. you know what i mean like that became a huge thing with you know the, yeah, the vietnam Iraq was War. different yeah absolutely and, and you know and that we had that counterpoint one time we were talking about it. i'm like well if you think about it though it's better than the other way it could have been like when you came back you know i would i i i see the problems that america's having right now and i would much rather don't thank me for my service tell me what me or my I or my brothers have influenced you to do for somebody else. What's the true impact? Yeah, you, yeah. You had, I understand. Thank for, thank us for our service. Us vets, we appreciate it because for years, especially the Vietnam and Korean War vets, we got nothing. You know, but I would rather have an, an American come up to me and say, you know what, because of people like you i've decided to volunteer to do this i i built my, my second wife when she was diagnosed with cancer and being treated for terminal colon cancer was still hanging drywall for uh habitat for humanity wow you know i want to see people we sit in a cigar shop every size shape creed color religion is in a cigar shop That's right. we all get along I would, I want to see a world where people, you don't have to be like me. I don't even have to like you and you don't have to like me, Yeah. but we got a job that needs to be done. And I would rather see people learn, learn to talk to each other. You know what I mean? Just, there's a lot to appreciate out there in the world. You well, know? I, th I think with a cigar shop though, it, it, we always talk about it, obviously on the podcast and you know, everyone in here smokes cigars and it, not everyone listening smokes cigars. I'll, I'll tell you that. That's a that's a fact with this podcast. There's there's a lot of people out there that don't even drink bourbon. They don't they don't smoke cigars. It's it's that uh, the part two where it's this part where yeah. you are. We all in the cigar shop. There there is this common bond that your common hobby, right? And that's the the model of this podcast. I'm not trying to like promote the podcast. If you're listening, you're already listening. So this is not what this is about. But it is what brings us together. And when I hear you say that, it's interesting because there absolutely any cigar shop you walk into, that was the design of, of part two of this this thing. Because there's so many like whiskey reviews, there's so many cigar review podcasts or YouTube videos. And and I feel like a lot of times we have benefited from from what you just said when you're sitting there and talking to someone, smoking a cigar. It's not the cigar necessarily, but it's the fact that you have a moment to sit down with friends people that may become friends, people you can't even stand. And yet you say, like you said to that bartender, you're like, yeah, I don't agree with you at all 
I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because there is that common thing. It's it, it, that's it. So, I mean, to, to, to use that as a metaphor in a sense, <clears throat> yeah. To I look it. at it as like, you take it up to treetop level. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we're, we're still all here. So you can, you can hate all you want. You can do all this stuff. And it's yeah. like, a, you know, tomorrow we're going to wake up and, and we got to figure this out again. Right. So what's the point of just throwing that first stone? I, I was never able to get everything I wanted in my life and I don't care. You know, I like that. I mean, if any of you guys, you know, got a credit card, I'd like a Porsche 911 before I die. You know, but... <laughs> my credit card will not cover that. No. <laughs> I'll cover the down payment, but I don't even want to do that. Now, you seem to be doing really well. I, I love hearing that perspective. I really do. Um, Going back to like sort of like the, the topic of the chapters of life, the, the sentiment that you shared, do you think that's something that you had, say, like when you just got out of Vietnam and that and that? situation i think i i think nom is what gave me that attitude you know what i mean world can go to shit in a heartbeat i was lucky i mean i got shot at at times never got hit did you volunteer but, yeah 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 never my brother was already in my mother blamed him for that uh for so me he had generations though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. um it I had guys that, you know, they'd talk to you one minute and you'd, they'd get in another bird, you know, and they'd take off on a flight and that bird didn't come back, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it could have been any one of us, you know? So it, it, it helps you move that, like you were saying, the hand in front of your yeah. face and the cigar shop kind of does that. It, you, you get in a situation where you're forced to move everything back because right now what's important is the glass of whiskey, the yeah. cigar, find out what the guy's smoking next to you. You know, if I ever become Supreme Benevolent Dictator of the world. <laughs> Are you running for office? Uh, well, Supreme Benevolent Dictators don't have to run. We oh, take it. Good, yeah. yeah, we take it. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, Remember that, me. By the way, that was his, <laughs> that's his <laughs> phrase. He, he declared me dictator. supreme benevolent dictator of the world. He's the vice. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> is going to have to smoke a cigar. That's it. Even Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> not, on that note, not in by the way, time. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, give, give, give Shannon the mic here. We've got the live studio audience. So all these chapters, what brought on the cigar shop? Like what brought mm. you into that world and how did you get involved? Yeah, you never really brought up the first time you smoked a cigar, right? I, uh, yeah, first time it. was trash. It was in Vietnam, whatever somebody handed me, you know, because the cigarettes got moldy in days sometimes and they everything, free, you know. Though, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, to basically. To give you an idea, you know, today's day and age, women, uh, people overseas, they're getting cigars from Cigars for Warriors. They're getting cookies and stuff like that. The stories I've heard from him in Vietnam was moldy cigarettes and warm Pabst Blue Ribbon. I, like, <laughs> it, it, it won a Blue Ribbon. It won a Blue Ribbon. That is a award-winning beer. Can you imagine a pallet of beer that sits in 120-degree sun, sometimes for days? Can I imagine it? Yes. What's the follow-up question? <laughs> Do I want to drink it? To this day, when Maybe. if I see a Paps can and I hear that, psh, my stomach still goes. So you're a Miller Lite guy, or what are you? Uh... <laughs> Someone get him a cold Miller Lite. Hey, uh, <laughs> Cheers, uh -uh. everyone. Uh -uh. Yeah, they want to sponsor us, by the way. <laughs> um, no, yeah, that's <laughs> of all the things. I, I want to make a point real quick for everyone listening. <laughs> of all the things that happen in your life. <laughs> That that's what PBR is what yeah is PBR your, was that is your that, struggle that was one of my, that was one of my struggles yes. <laughs> struggle. how to live how to live in a world that still has PBR again blue ribbon yeah. uh, they didn't go through it <clears throat> I mean we used to get the base I was the the base at my squadron our home base uh, actually had they baked their own breads you know I could even handle turning over the loaf of bread and seeing you know bugs baked into the bottom of the bread. And protein. that didn't bother me, but the PBR. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of PBR, but I haven't had. Uh... 
TV you want to keep it cold. <laughs> Beer, anyone out there, you want to keep it cold. We, we'd put like a 50-pound block of ice on a stack of beer, and you could see the 50-pound block melt. Because it doesn't want to be there even. It didn't want to be there. <laughs> it doesn't want anything to do with that pallet as much as you don't want to. By the way, talking about changes in life, those beer cans required a church key. You actually had to have a K-bar or a regular church key to open the beer. For Which all these millennials out there that are pulling these little tabs up yours. <laughs> <laughs> Pour this guy another glass. And I we're not going to talk goes. about what you want to be a real is. hipster drinking PBR. You better pull out your church key. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows what a church key is anymore. <laughs> huh. K bar, none. <laughs> all right. So, Ryan, what have you, uh, you, you brought to him? Absolutely. And I'm uh, responsible for this mess I, in a good way. Uh, you know, chime in here a little bit, obviously. I mean, like, what have you learned from you, Tim or just in general? No, from Tim. And, and, you know, the fact that you said you're, you're what, 34, 34, you're 34 years old. You've gone through a couple of life changes. You know, you're in the, so the I, dating I, world. You're, you're I a traveling salesperson. This. I will, I will share this. So, and again, I don't know if anybody ever disputes this, but Steve's topics truly sometimes aren't really thought up until hours before the show. Can you not? what uh was it, <laughs> they're thought out months in advance oh yeah is it, yeah you, you don't know that steve actually wrote out 2000 episodes of bourbon and bs before he ever actually it's did all falling in place yeah. it's all falling in place so you, you dropped what it was on me earlier today easy and well, it, it doesn't matter i like it i mean i i think that that helps keep it genuine really because you don't sit there and right, reverse yeah. answers and stuff aside, like that yeah. but like that being said like even when i heard what it was it's funny, like where your mind goes. And when I your was, answer back when I sent you the promo shot was fuck yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's awesome. Especially like having Tim and everything, because yeah, you know, I, I thought it was a it was a great way to do it. And um it's weird where my mind went. When I was 14, I actually started writing a book. And the whole premise of the book. Uh, to give you where my head was at at 14, the whole premise was there would be these topics in the book. And my idea was, wouldn't it be interesting if I wrote about these topics every five to 10 years? So as you read the passage about, say, love or uh, death or whatever, it actually matured as you as you read it. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing is, I started writing the book and I, I kept on it for like a couple of years. And I was like, you know what? This is dumb. Uh, the, the, the flaw with this whole plan is if I really want this to have the impact that, that I think it would have, yeah. I need to know what I would be writing about for the rest of my life. And, and I really don't know, like, I don't have enough topics to really write on all of this. Yeah. So I kind of abandoned it. And like, the ironic thing is fast forward, literally 20 years later, I then start to realize how like, kind of like ignorant and almost how to that actually was like to the point because if I was writing it, like say for instance, when I, when I wrote the original stuff, you know, I'm 14, one of my best friends died, you know, yeah. I, I loved movies. I loved music. You know, I was into poetry a little bit and stuff like that. Short stories, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's where I picked up my love, like Edgar Allan Poe, things like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I'm like thinking to myself now and I'm like, wouldn't that kind of be the point? Because, like, think about it. I didn't have a chapter about family. I didn't have a chapter about politics. I didn't have a chapter about, you know, this or that. And it's like, wasn't that kind of the whole idea? Like, what changes? Right. Yeah. Like, now I'm 20. And you now I care about politics. I'm going to start writing about politics. And now I'm 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 30. And now I want to write about family. It, it, it's actually kind of, like, weird how, like, when I go back to it, I was like, man, like, if I didn't think that I had this figured out, when was the last time you actually wrote in that? Probably about the time I was like 18. You still have it? Probably on a floppy disk. No. <laughs> <laughs> on a zip drive? Like, I don't like. Right. I'm you sure want to borrow my somewhere. tablet and a pen that you write with them? No, the, we actually had computers when I was young, believe it or not. <laughs> like, I, I, like, th I think you should. I think you should pick it back up. Yeah. So, like, it was just kind of interesting that when I read. When you said that, that was the first place my mind went. Yeah, I haven't exactly thought about it, like I said, in like 15 years. This is one of those masterpieces that, it's a masterpiece. uh, you know, um, like like Dewey Cox. That this is going to be, this is going to be my like Dewey Cox. I leave. 
No, I, I think that, that that's something that I, I, I first of all find that and and start it again without reading it. Without reading it. Yeah, without reading it. I think I think you should start that. Yeah, maybe. Because this is something that I think that that I look back at, you know, high school, um, middle school and everything else. I I have a I have a bad memory. Right. My brother was blessed with memory. Like you know, he he can remember when we were in Chicago area and you know, like he I I lived in a suburb of Chicago between ages of three and seven. So he's two years older, so five and nine, and he can remember everything, even before that. Right. And um, we always joked about it that I can't remember. I, I have like three second bursts from like middle school. I have like maybe like 10 minute bursts of memories in, in high school. It's not it's not blocking it out, but it's like I, I look back and I, I I feel fortunate that I can remember like my my, my college years and and, and, yeah. and, and and 20s and and 30s. But, you know, I get I get tied into what's happening now. And, and a lot of times I'll bring it up on the podcast too, is that sometimes your, your best example of what you need to be is, is your past self. Right. Um, and they can't hear you nod Tim, but, um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's something that, you know, you get so tied up, you get so turned around, um, that you, 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 you sometimes look elsewhere for that example. And a lot of times it's yourself. So I, I'd, I'd encourage you because you are, you know, like, uh, obvious, you know, said earlier that, into photography you have that that artistic side of you that you know hearing and, and, and tying yourself into to people and gentlemen like tim there's a lot of things that have changed over obviously from the time you're 18 to, to in your 30s now it would be actually that'd be a good read right where where it would be one of those things where it's almost like a um not a memoir that as you look it, back it would be very different yeah, yeah it actually be accurate like right. this is what i thought then this is right. what i think now but you never go back until you are right at that memoir state of, of being in your 60s or 70s like and we, you just bring up all these old writings i i, I don't think that's we, been done a whole we, lot and we, i think that's something that's interesting we, we, you know like for instance like you know like love and stuff like that like how many times you tell somebody you love them whatever and like Particularly in the idea of relationship, the tell you all the time. Particularly, you do, but particularly like in relationships. Yeah. Like, do you remember what it was like to be in love? Like the first time you just absolutely like fell for. No, it was everything. You know what I mean? Like, it was everything. And it's crazy. And and like, <clears throat> I, I sort of almost think of it as like almost like chasing the dragon. And and maybe that's where I am in life, where, you know, you remember what it was like that first time. It's so incredible, and you're like, oh, it has to be this. But maybe it doesn't have to be that. You know what I mean? Like, but as you get older, you start to look at these things differently. Well, that's what I like about having someone like Tim on here is that, you know, you have this perspective as someone that looks back on all these experiences and, and what I, what I, I don't have and what none of the listeners have is, is, is an episode like this or a conversation with Tim 40 years ago, well, and, 50 years ago. And Tim has you talking about being, like short on memory tim once told me like this technique he has do you do you remember when you told me about how you have certain memories and you put them in a box with yeah. wrapping paper i is that a metaphor is that literal no actually back oh about 1962 1963 i started taking martial arts lessons in Pittsburgh. And this is in the days, you know, before you had a karate studio on every block, there were like two schools in Pittsburgh at the time. One of them was the very beginning of that, uh, CS Kim's. And I guess they're almost nationwide now. And another one was the school that I went to, uh, the dojo I went to. And one of the things that we did in those days was you learn meditation and everything above and beyond. You would learn more than just karate or jujitsu striking okay yeah. you, you learn more and one of the things i learned from the sensei at the time was that idea uh, almost like you're saying moving the hand back yeah. from the face if you can't solve something i just sort of put it in a box you know mentally put it in a box and put it on a shelf it was very important to me that box was in my mind was highly decorated that so not meant, you're not you're not talking about like bottling it up you're not bottling it up. No, putting it up just on a pedestal. Put almost. It up, yeah. yeah, just put it on the shelf for a little yeah. while. Yeah. And it taught me that ability to say, I can't deal with this right now. 
And that's completely different than going, I can't deal with it. I'm never going to deal with it. Right. You know, you put right. it, you're working on a project at home, you know, and you run it, whatever it is, plumbing, carpentry, whatever you yeah. run into a problem. If you can sit and you don't know what you're doing, you can continue hammering away at it. You're going to have crap work when you're done. Yeah. You know, but if you sit back you rush it, and when you know you got the tools, maybe it was, you know, you just needed the right tool, you know, or whatever, then you can go back to that box. Yeah. Sometimes pull you don't it know. out, unwrap it and deal with it. You don't know the tool exists sometimes. Yeah. You don't know it exists, yeah. you know, and it gives you that. I, I have a horrible short term memory right now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it could be age, you know, uh, I, my, my short term memory memory is not as good as I would like it. You know, I, I forget where I put things a lot, a lot more than normal, but it's kind of funny when I'm solving certain problems, I do kind of like he was saying with a book, I, I, I look back a little bit yeah. and go, somebody had to give me this answer somewhere. Somebody, um, Somebody had to give me some guidelines somewhere. Yeah. Like I was about 13, 14 years old. My grandmother decided she went a new siding put on her house. This guy shows up to put the siding on and he's missing his arm and shoulder. No shit. I'm fascinated because this guy's like, you know, using his forehead to hold something <laughs> up while he tacks it. And I, I, I had to ask, you know, 13 year old, you're not going to think. I it did. I would have never thought I could have embarrassed the guy. It wouldn't even come into my mind. But I ask him how he does all that, and he says, "How many fingers and toes do you have? Uh, fingers, toes, and uh, yeah, fingers and toes." Yeah. And I said, 20. He says, "How many do you think I have?" And I looked down. I said, 15. And he goes, "No." He says, "I got about 25." And I'm like, "What?" I'm and he goes, too. I got my elbow, my knee, my chin, there you go. my teeth, you know, whatever. And I never thought about it. You know, it was kind of like, okay, he taught me a lesson. Never thought about it till I lost a hand. And that was one of those memories that came back. Do you know the guy's name? <laughs> yeah, it was Smith. <laughs> yeah. But here's the best part. The first girl I started dating when I came back from Vietnam, she takes me to the family house. Guess who? Do not tell me he was in that house. <laughs> it was her. It was her dad. Get the fuck out and of here. A, and they had, a, here. And they, had they had a three legged dog. I don't. I don't. <laughs> all right. Let the record show. I don't believe anything you said to me the whole time. I, this is now officially hit. Her the name was. Meter. I think you have two arms. <laughs> <laughs> I think this whole thing's bullshit. Call it off. But I walked in the house and I looked at this guy and I went, and she, she had told me, she says, yeah, my, I already knew her dad only had one arm. I'd never met him. Are you serious? No, because she, she used to tell all her friends who she had a one-armed dad, or a one-armed boyfriend and a three-legged dog. And she was right. Who did, and you were number three on that list. <laughs> I was number three on the list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were. <laughs> He didn't remember me, no. But and it took me a while <laughs> till he started talking about being a contractor. I can't. And then it kind of dawned on me, you know. And it was kind of like I would have never I never remembered him or even what he told me till that day when I met him again. And then that bit of advice that he gave me that I had long forgot about. That's when it came. That was one of those other little things that told me. You know, life ain't that, you know, life, you, you're going to go on. Yeah. You know. So I, I got to, <laughs> we can't top that story. Brian, you're up. <laughs> yeah. So, so Tim, this is the time when we go into closing remarks because there's nothing left to say <laughs> in the normal dialogue after that full circle story. And I'm glad you didn't lead with that story. Because <laughs> if you led with that story. Uh, that would have been the shortest podcast if you would have led with it like 15 minutes in. I'm like, everybody immediately just, I got nothing. I got nothing. Out. Back I got to that nothing. memory thing. I no, didn't I'm going to do a snapshot me. of that and put it on Instagram because I, I still can't wrap my head around that. Jeez. Is that a small town? When I graduated, no, uh, about 80 or 90,000 then now 30,000. Depro it's Went down, it's yeah. a yeah, oh down. it's a depressed area. area. My shop should not fly where it's at. 
Well, it's good people, uh, but, though. Yeah. You know, I, I figured there was money around me. It's probably gone up Build since it. Ryan They'll come. Left, right? Huh? Went up in business since Ryan left. Yeah. Oh, yeah, a lot. yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to tell you a story. <laughs> And 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 if Alan and Alec and all those guys are listening, Alan he was and watching I earlier. I don't know if he's had still actually on. considered pulling Alec Bradley A B off the shelf. Yeah. We we had actually considered pulling it off the shelf when he became the rep. I won't name the other companies, but now he's neck and neck with my other two big uh, you know. <laughs> I don't think you're so, alone in that though with Ryan. No. No, I don't oh, think you're did. alone. In those shops, yeah. So, Alan, territory. if you're listening, <laughs> pat him on the head. Yeah, we need more Corinthian leathers out there. Corinthian leathers, that's all we need. Um, exclusive Corinthian leather deal. Ryan, closing remarks. Part um, two. Man, you're leading with me. I'm, I'm nervous. Well, I need you to frame it for Tim. Frame it for Tim. We've had a lot of time. We, we, we have had a lot of time. With it. No, I mean, this, this kind of went how I thought it would go because, like, it's funny, like, the idea to bring Tim on when we were leading with Corinthian leather. And like, I joked about bringing the wiggle. Cause it's like kind of me and whatever. And like, Tim's definitely a big part of my life. You know what I mean? So I guess technically that is, but there's one about how I would expect in the sense that I'm like, yeah, Tim's going to talk the entire time. Cause like, if, especially when you, when I saw chapter chapters of life, I'm like, this this could be a thirty part installment, you know, with Tim talking. Yeah, we about. have a long night ahead of us. Oh, That's absolutely. what I'm saying. Like, there's going to be more parts. Like, you got to keep. We're going to keep going. We're going to hydrate. But, um, <laughs> you guys aren't going anywhere. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're talking chapters of life, I'm 34. This is this is to be continued, baby. I'll be here for Bourbon and BS number 674, talking about chapter of life again. Yeah, we we'll re- we will uh, revisit this. For we'll sure, have to yeah. revisit it. It has to be. I think it's fair, right? And then we yeah. can go back and we can watch this after we're done with it. That'd be kind of cool. This would be the better episode. Do it 30 years from now when he's missing a limb, old and crotchety like me with a bad memory. What? You are the best. You are the How best is he going to lose a limb? You are I mean, the best part. I'm going to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've got a whole. I've it has got nothing a whole, to do with Nam or anything I, else. I, like. I've got a closet full of leftover arms. I, what? I, 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 I've thought about. You you have no idea. Like, gonna lock being a one off? Rep, that... being a sales rep, is, being yeah. on the road. Well, he has to fit the ones I got in the closet. <laughs> being, a a sales rep, down. <laughs> being a sales rep and on the road. Yeah. I've thought about dying in violent interstate car crashes so many times. That's, that's and a then, terrible like, way of living. Well, of course. But I've like thought like, well, what if I live? But like, you know, like I end up missing a leg or something like that. And I'm like, well, I guess I have to then go take over the dirty dog. Like, like it would, I would only like I would usurp his business partners and be like, I it, nature has selected me to run the shop for the rest of my life. Like it's over. Like you're your nature's because, because nature's the, royalty. The funny thing is, not not to expand my closer remark, the story of how I met Tim is one of my favorite stories in the cigar business where I was smoking a cigar on my back porch. I, I was a young kid uh not that i'm fucking particularly old now but i had a buddy that we were friends but we didn't always hang out all the time but he lived like right above me and i ran into him one day and he goes hey man i saw you were smoking cigars on the back porch i'm like you smoke cigars i was like we should smoke cigars sometime he's like nah i do that shit by myself i don't want to smoke with other people i'm like all right cool i respect that he's like did you know that a guy opened up a cigar shop right across the bridge with a hook for an arm and i was like no and he goes you have to buy your cigars from a guy with a hook for an arm. <laughs> and, and I was like, he's fucking right. Like, like, and that's what led me to Tim. That's what started all of this. <laughs> was there a why? No, you just have to. Think about it. If you went in and Brian had one arm, would you be more inclined to buy cigars from a guy with one arm? I don't know. Especially man. if Brian had an eye patch, he'd be an evil looking fucking guy. I'll tell you <laughs> he what. Would, he would like be. if he had a hook for an arm and an eye patch, that motherfucker could be like now you have both. Well, <laughs> you might. all you need's a parrot after that. <laughs> Jesus. But uh yeah. So I, happy we can make light of this stuff. Yeah. yeah that's cool, well, man. and that's part of life, man. You, you develop this sense of you like Tim saying, perspective, sense of humor, all that stuff is why we're still here. You you I like that. You you seriously have to take what life throws at you and realize what's important and what's not. And you learn to deal with it. And whether or not you've been provided the lesson or whether or not that is the lesson, that's where we're going. I love it. Ryan Ponis signing off. Ryan Ponis LLC. <laughs> Trademark. Cigarma Mater, copyright. <laughs> <laughs> no, you actually brought before Tim. One of the things you, you 
reminded me of what was talked about tonight is that when when Tim said, and I have to, I don't know if you said it like this, but this is how I took it was when you were riding your motorcycle and your hook fell off, and you're like, of course the guy with <laughs> With no leg, classic leg amputee <laughs> oh, yeah. says Just you're like fucked. I'm amputee. like, yeah, yeah. what does that have to do with anything? Like, <laughs> this is this is who the leg amputees are. <laughs> you know, that yeah. he's like looking yeah. at you with your arm. Yeah, you're fucked. <laughs> See ya. I got two arms. Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Tim, what are your closing remarks there? I enjoyed coming out here, guys. This was thank a, you. It's this, our pleasure. This was a good break. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, like I, I said, you know, I, I gave some stories here, you know, uh, I, I, I've got a lot to learn from other people. And I, I hope that something that I said tonight, that somebody learned something from it. You yeah. Know, if nothing else, how to ask for a refill in a glass. You know? <laughs> it's coming. Use your hook attachment. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Just swing. <laughs> yeah, just swing. And to that point, I hope everyone that. does. As you do your closing remarks, I hope everyone shares this. Anyone that took something from this, share it because people need to hear these stories. Absolutely. I feel very, very fortunate to hear those, but I, I think that people need to share that. We sit in the shop. We have a cup. We had up until recently a very old Korean war veteran. When he first came in the shop, he could he could hardly converse. He was that old. His son brought him in. He'd just, just sit there and grunt at you and chain smoke cigars. Couldn't carry on a conversation. Six months of hanging in the shop, he was talkative. You know, he had somebody to share. They brought him out and everything. Um, the day he passed, we felt that the best one-liners in the shop were history. Wow. You know, because we lost that knowledge. Yeah. You know, he couldn't converse very well, but when he did say something, you you laughed. You had something to listen to, you know, and then no matter what anybody had for a story he had something 30 or 40 years before you know and you learn something every when time you he listened yeah because right. you listen and it's i think that stuff like this is what everybody needs to do you need to listen to the guy sitting next to you the guy sitting across from you you don't have to like him yeah you know absolutely uh, i you know you sitting next to me i i i can't say i don't like you i mean i don't know you that well but uh <laughs> I can change it yeah. either way. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, get him out of here right after we're done. <laughs> it's done. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> wrap it up. Um, no, you're absolutely right. I think that, that there is something there. You know, uh, when, you, when you talk about like the chapters of life at the very end of this whole episode, you bring up this, this, this gentleman that, um, you know, Korean war vet and, uh, you know, someone else brought him in mm -hmm. and uh, at first, didn't have a whole lot to say, but he kept coming in. And yeah. Everyone just let him be. Mm -hmm. Probably poked him a little bit, you know what I mean? Just like mm -hmm. anyone else, like, oh, you're back, you know, have, trying to get something mm -hmm. out of him. Once the comfort level comes out, and I think that's that's a big part of it. And, and Ryan, I'll bring you into this, too, is um, one of the things that stuck with me tonight, too. All these great stories. I mean, all these great stories. I, I, I'm going to listen back to part two. I don't always listen back to the episodes. Because I feel like I, I, I have them on record. So if I need to, again, that that, that memory thing, like if I need to listen right. to it to, to recall these things. But uh, I'm going to listen back to these because I know of all these stories, Tim, that you shared and Ryan, that you 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 brought him here and you also shared. Um, there's a lot of information there. And uh, you bring up this this person. What's what's the uh, the gentleman's name that passed away recently, like the Korean War vet? Oh, uh, Bob, uh, um, Karsnack. Karsnack, yeah, um, Bob Karsnack. You know, when you finally have that opportunity to listen to the stories or the jokes, you know, they know more than you know. Yeah, it's not always something that you agree with, right? right. I mean, that's 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 a it's right, absolutely fact. I I think everybody has to learn that you know you're not going to get everything you want in your life. You know, you can't have everything your way, but probably the best way is a little bit of what you want and a little bit of what somebody else wants. Normally, I do a lot of <laughs> closing <laughs> comments. <laughs> Tim, you're up. You're you're upstaging me, man. 
I don't appreciate it, but uh, <laughs> I respect it. Join us next week with Bourbon and BS with Tim Colich. No. <laughs> Steve, we're in your garage. Just yeah, I'll it. just send the audience next time. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, no, I think that the, yeah, the chapters of life thing, I, I think you were the perfect guest for that. Thank you. I think this this worked out really well. I hope uh, people um, got a lot from it because I know I did. And uh, the biggest thing I got from it was to sit back and listen. Because I think of those stories, Tim, you're saying you're in those bars and people want to like, you know, your mindset from not day one, but let's 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 frame it as day one when you're in that Navy hospital. And you're 20, 21 years old, and now you have this whole life ahead of you, hopefully. Now, fast forward yeah. 50 some years. You didn't know that was going to happen. You didn't know no. you 50 more years. But you have that mindset that you you this is what we have to deal with now. Mm -hmm. And we as you and everyone else in your life. So now fast forward to the point that you have this person like that, that Bob in your cigar shop, that finally when he opens up, there is so much wealth of knowledge, right? And and mentality there, that anyone listening to this podcast, you you need a microphone, and you need to start writing this shit down. Because this is a memoir that you know, like I was saying to Ryan that start it now. This is a lesson to be learned in my my opinion that you have that one that that those stories that you're writing that probably in your parents' house somewhere, you know what I mean? 18, you stopped writing that. And, and now fast forward to your 30s. And and this is this Tim being your inspiration of all these stories. Why not write that stuff down? Why not reflect in your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s? Now you're in your 70s. Because I think that that is a good self-reflection that somehow Tim has this memory that he can tell us stories all day long. Well, and I think like as weird as it sounds as we're talking about this stuff, um, something comes to mind. It's an Andy Warhol quote, which is basically when he said, in the future, everybody will have their 15 seconds of fame. And I don't think maybe, you know, going deep and cerebral with it, Fame doesn't have to be YouTube. Fame doesn't have to be Instagram. Fame doesn't have to be television. You can give somebody 15 seconds of fame and maybe you'll learn something from it. Absolutely. And I, that can be on a an episode. We can literally, no one's watching out there right now, if that were the case. Right. We could set up microphones and, and make Tim feel like he's talking to the world. I learned a lot. Right. And And I think that's the big part of it is that you can be tim in this garage right now you can be bob in that cigar shop you can be just someone that actually you sit back and ask questions and listen and learn the chapters of life from someone else because whatever chapter you're in tim said it a lot tonight there are a lot of people that were complaining about their job complaining about their relationship complaining about whatever situation they were in at that point the story's not over and it's about writing the next chapter. I look at it as motivation and I hope that I can apply a lot of things I learned tonight that, you know, starting tomorrow, I can, I can have more fire. I can have more, um, frame of mind that will be a positive impact, not only to myself, but the people that I surround myself with and the people that I get introduced to in my life going forward, that I can be impacted, uh, as strongly as, uh, Tim and, and Ryan, you impact me tonight. So with that, thank you guys, um, studio audience, uh, live audience, anyone that listens to this on the audio on uh, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, everything else. I mean, this is something that we do because it's, it's amazing how that after the after hours in the cigar shop that this part two is that atmosphere. It, it was. It's yeah. weird, right? Like yeah. it's, you're, you don't talk into the microphone when you're talking at your cigar right. shop. No. But it, it feels really natural. So, guys, thank you to the sponsors, Tinderbox at Easton, Patreon.com, all you guys out there, Patreon.com slash Bourbon BS Podcast, all today's USA, the guys there, Josh and Paul and everyone else, thank you for sponsoring us and uh, making this happen. Also, be a cigar company. I'm probably going to light one up after hours here because we are going to just keep recording. I'm just kidding. We're not going to yeah. keep recording. <laughs> we'll get you back in the garage. Um, guys, cheers. Thank you very much, everyone. Raise your glass. Cheers. Thank you.